Okay, our next speaker, who we've all been waiting for, is uh, Dr. Dick DeBilzig from the University of Wisconsin. Uh, currently, he's an associate professor. He'll be speaking on diseases of the dog and cat. Historically, he received his DDM degree at the University of Minnesota in 1972 and received his diplomate status from the American College of Veterinary Pathologists in 1977. And we sent an F-16 yesterday to pick him up in Wisconsin, and he's with us this afternoon. Well, thank you for having me. I, uh, in, in putting this talk together, I uh, organized things perhaps a little bit differently than what you've, uh, uh, some of the talks that you've heard. Uh, I, t I purposely chose uh, diseases that are a little bit off the beaten track in terms of uh, uh, their, uh, importance and significance. I try to choose diseases uh, that are of particular interest to me and, disease, and some diseases that have been more re a little bit more recently uh, uh, in the literature or uh, worked out. Uh, some of them are of uh, considerable importance and some of them are a little bit more obscure. Uh, sitting and listening to the talks that we've had, I ha I've had some second thoughts about doing that. Um, I've been, I, and I've, it's been such a pleasure and such a privilege to uh, listen to these uh, wonderful uh, comprehensive uh, overviews of uh, diseases in, in various species, and I'm wishing now that I had tried to put together a little bit more comprehensive uh, discussion of disease, uh, diseases in dogs and cats. Uh, uh, I'd be interested in, uh, in people's feedback uh, on these as we go. I also want to uh, extend a particular uh, thanks and appreciation for the people that uh, switched their schedules around so that uh, they could accommodate uh, my uh, uh, tardiness. Uh, I wasn't snowed in. A lot of people have said that, it suggested that I was snowed in. But what, what we had is uh, we had a fairly recent snow and then warm weather with uh, extremely moist uh, uh, air. And uh, southern Wisconsin, when I was trying to leave, was uh, just a pea soup fog. Milwaukee Airport was closed, and Madison was uh, only had some flights going out of it. So uh, it took me a while. Actually, it was closed the next day, too. But they did send a direct flight from Madison to uh, Washington, which they wouldn't normally do. Uh, so I was able to get here. I guess we need the lights. Do I turn? I may as well confess right off to some biases. Uh, I do have a bias for diseases of the oral cavity, particularly dental diseases, and I also have a bias for diseases of the uh, eyes. Uh, those biases may be fairly obvious as we go through these. Uh, there, uh, for those of you uh, with a more dis discriminating uh, uh, ability, uh, you might also notice my uh, bias against the liver as we go through this. <laughs> this is the oral cavity of a dog. I didn't realize how difficult it was to see from up here. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the general topic here, obviously, is uh, oral neoplasia. Uh, does anybody want to suggest the differential diagnosis and uh, destructive oral neoplasia in the dog? squamous cell carcinoma, fibrosarcoma, and malignant melanoma. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, on gross examination, unless you've really got a really black tumor, uh, you can't uh, make the distinction between those uh, three. So that some people refer to them as big three. The oral cavity is a fairly common uh, site to find uh, uh, significant life-threatening uh, 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 malignant disease in, in, in dogs uh, in particular. In cats, uh, uh, squamous cell carcinoma uh, of either the gingiva or the tongue would be uh, probably most significant. Fibrosarcoma less significant, and I don't believe I've ever seen a melanoma in uh, in the oral cavity of a do of a cat. We have a uh, possibility to examine these a little bit more carefully. They, uh, a little bit more can be said about the distinction. Uh, this is the fibrosar fibrosarcoma uh, has been frozen and, and then sectioned to show the invasive nature of this tumor. Uh, uh, oral fibrosarcoma is uh, often a, a very invasive tumor. A word of caution uh, uh, in terms of histopathology of oral fibrosarcoma, uh, they tend to be notorious for their uh, being very well differentiated. And you get a small biopsy of a tumor like this, uh, oftentimes uh, you're tempted to make a diagnosis of proliferating fibrovascular connective tissue. Uh, uh, it, uh, it's good always, if you have any questions at all, to get the veterinarian on the phone and ask what's going on because uh, I think you can see if you made a diagnosis of granulation tissue or something in a, in a mass like this that would lead to a considerable amount of embarrassment. Uh, so often these are, are uh, fairly obviously uh, neoplastic when you get a chance to, to, to look at them.
there is a uh, uh, fibrous, there is a slight uh, predilection for oral fibrosarcoma as opposed to the other tumors to occur in uh, uh, large breed dogs uh, uh, with a tendency to be a little bit younger than the, than the other uh, tumors. This is a malignant melanoma of the uh, rostral uh, mandible. Uh, uh, tumors of melanocytic origin in dogs are interesting to me in that the uh, biological behavior of these tumors uh, seems to vary with the site of the, of the primary tumor. Uh, uh, those that occur on the uh, oral cavity side of the lips uh, tend to be very invasive uh, with distant metastases, both hematogenous and lymphatic. Uh, uh, occurring fairly early in the process, and uh, and we uh, 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 will fairly frequently see do uh, dogs with widespread uh, metastasis of malignant melanoma. They don't all, of course, have to be uh, heavily pigmented, uh, and uh, non-pigmented ones, uh, uh, as I already mentioned, can be difficult to distinguish from other oral uh, neoplasia. Uh, those that occur on the lips, in my experience, can be sort of ACDC. We see much, th in terms of prognosis, they have a much uh, uh, better prognosis than those that occur in the gingiva or uh, deeper in the oral cavity. Uh, uh, we see them on the, on the hard palate and occasionally on the soft palate, uh, as well as on the buccal surface uh, and on the gingiva. Uh, those that occur in the haired skin are almost invariably benign. Uh, uh, I've seen malignant uh, uh, melanomas that have occurred on the scrotum. Uh, and then the other, another area where we see malignant tumors of uh, melanocytic origin are at, at the nail bed. Uh, uh, interestingly enough. Uh, within the eye, uh, uh, I'll show some pictures of, of melanomas, but just for the review that uh, we're doing here, uh, those that occur uh, uh, at the epibulbar in the limbal area are almost always benign. Uh, about 80% of the tumors that occur within the eye are very benign, uh, but 20% uh, have uh, mitotic figures and the uh, histological appearance of a malignant tumor, although uh, very few of those uh, actually uh, metastasized. There have been proven metastases uh, from intraocular tumors. On the other hand, uh, melanomas that occur in the conjunctiva uh, are, are notorious for recurrence and, and, and distant metastasis. So it's an interesting uh, topic in, in uh, particularly in canine medicine. This is an amelanotic melanoma, again a frozen skull. Uh, showing a tumor uh, mainly originating on the buccal surface here, but uh, showing a highly invasive uh, uh, neoplasm extending into the maxillary bone and, and around the tooth. I'm a proponent oftentimes uh, for the purposes of uh, uh, studying the interaction between soft tissue and bony tissue of uh, uh, making of uh, freezing tissues and uh, ma uh, making slab sections. Uh, I think you can get, uh, accomplish a lot in terms of studying uh, disease that way. This is a rather small but uh, invasive uh, squamous cell carcinoma. If there's anything typical about squamous cell carcinoma, it's a, uh, in, in dogs, it's a tendency to form these uh, uh, granular, almost uh, uh, multilobulate or almost papillary uh, 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 appearance when they occur in the soft tissues. Uh, in cats, squamous cell carcinoma, the oral cavity is much more likely to be a deeply ulcerative uh, lesion, uh, although you see that uh, configuration in, in dogs uh, occasionally as well. Again, a, a highly invasive tumor. Very difficult to make a distinction between the, the three tumors. Okay, we will see some more unusual tumors occasionally in very young dogs, uh, usually less than a year of age. We'll, we will see fairly sharply delineated raised papillary tumors of uh, stratified squamous epithelium as well. Uh, these are tumors that, are, that will invade deeply into the bone, but they have very sharp uh, uh, basement membrane boundaries. Uh, uh, we used to call them inverted papilloma, and I think they call them papillary squamous cell carcinoma uh, now. Uh, uh, have a little bit different biological behavior. They're more benign in terms of their uh, invasive ability. Uh, I remember when I was at Penn, we would, uh, uh, they seemed to be exquisitely sensitive to uh, radiation therapy. Uh, the, the, the big tip off here is that uh, these occur in young dogs. This is, I believe, that same dog with a trichrome stain, and you can see the uh, tumor invading uh, down and ar uh, around the tooth. Uh, very well differentiated stratified squamous epithelium with very smooth uh, basement membrane boundaries. Okay, uh, I've done some uh, uh, work with the tumors that we find around the, at the uh, gingival tooth margin, uh, uh, epulides. And the only one I'm really going to talk about here is, the, is what, what I call, anyway, the acanthoma de sepulis. Uh, 
th I'll give you my view of, of Epulus, and, and I realize that there's a, uh, a, a resurgence of literature on these, uh, each, each suggesting different uh, uh, terminology and, and, and names, uh, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll just give you a little bit of discussion on that. T to me, the hallmark of uh, what I call Epulus, uh, uh, or, or what we refer to in veterinary medicine as Epulus, uh, uh, is the uh, participation of the periodontal ligament in the, in the proliferative reaction. Now, already there's a lot of confusion because the term epulis itself simply means a tumor-like uh, mass at the, at the gingival margin. Uh, and uh, probably if I could uh, write the original paper I had over again, I would probably have steered away from the term epulis altogether because it leads to quite a bit of confusion as more and more uh, oral pathologists are getting into this uh, business, uh, the more that confusion is uh, causing particular problems. Basically, you have two forms of epulis. Uh, uh, a form in which the uh, fibrostroma or the periodontal ligament is the predominant change that you see, uh, and I call that the fibroma deceptulus of periodontal ligament origin. Uh, in those tumors, you also see uh, a, a smaller component of epithelium and uh, 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 collagenous matrix. I'm trouble hearing you in the back. Oh, okay. Can we move that mic up a little bit? Sure. Can I ask a question? Can we move that mic up a little bit? I'm going to put on your Adam's apple. How about... Voice. Okay, uh, so I described the fibroma de uh, out There's also a form of uh, epulis in which there is a major component of uh, collagenous hard substance, uh, and uh, this is sometimes referred to as the ossifying epulis. Uh, uh, it is essentially a uh, ossifying variation of the, of the uh, fibroma de And the other type uh, uh, that I, the, of terminology that I like to use is what uh, we call the acanthoma de Fibroma de sepulis, although it is an uh, expansile lesion, usually it's uh, quite benign in, in both its appearance and behavior. It's epithelial covered, uh, and you do not see bone destruction. With the acanthoma de sepulis, so the, the hallmark is uh, deep invasion and bone destruction around the alveolus. The, uh, whoops. <coughs> yeah. I think I better hold this in my hand. You, you <laughs> I didn't swallow, I, I swear. Is this, <laughs> this seems to rumble a lot when I hold it. Is this what people are holding? I think that'd be fine if you just hold it. <coughs> so histologically, the hallmark of the acanthoma sepulis is the presence of a, of a uh, profound epithelial proliferation, uh, where, and the epithelial component is, uh, is invasive. The reason why I think that they're related is that uh, if you have a, uh, 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 an acanthoma de sepulis which is not uh, heavily damaged by uh, trauma or infection, you can still recognize the periodontal uh, ligament nature of the stroma, and that's the reason why I think they're related. This is that same tumor, a uh, radiograph of that same tumor showing lysis of the alveolar bone around the tooth. These tumors tend to occur uh, immediately adjacent to the tooth, and that's one of the dis distinguishing features between squamous cell carcinoma, which can occur anywhere. Obviously, squamous cell carcinoma occurring next to the tooth would be uh, uh, a differential diagnosis in, in this disease. Histologically, uh, uh, again, the hallmark here, you can see the basophilic invasion of these uh, tumor cells uh, deeply into the bone around, around the alveolar socket. Uh, this happens to be uh, the mandibular uh, cortex, and you can see the moth-eaten appearance of the cortex uh, and uh, invasive bone uh, in, the, uh, in the superficial subgingival connective tissue as well. Although these tumors are invasive, they do not metastasize, and uh, with uh, more and more radical jaw surgery, uh, they are usually fairly successfully treated by uh, su uh, surgical, uh, uh, rather aggressive surgical intervention. And we see biopsy specimens, uh, in which include major portions of the jaw, and uh, at least the surgeons report that those animals uh, uh, live a happy, healthy life. Uh, it's sometimes hard to imagine. One uh, feature of this tumor that we do occasionally see is uh, reoccurrence down the line, uh, and, and when we get reoccurrence, uh, as often as not, it will be a different tumor that reoccurs, uh, and there are uh, uh, two possibilities. The major tumor that we see in the reoccurrence is squamous cell carcinoma, and, uh, the, and, and in smaller numbers of cases, we'll see reoccurrence of fibrosarcoma, and uh, there's also been reports of osteosarcoma at the, uh, at the same site. Uh, some of these reoccurrences have uh, occurred in animals that have been irradiated, and it's quite possible that irradiation 
has something to do with the reoccurrence. If, you, uh, if you're very careful in your initial assessment of these tumors, uh, it's not unusual to find foci within the tumor of uh, uh, squamous cell uh, deterioration of these uh, tumors. This, in this one in particular, this area down here, uh, if you had that alone, you'd, you'd make a diagnosis of squamous cell carcinoma. So I think that the uh, reoccurrence may uh, well be an indication of uh, malignant deterioration within the uh, uh, primary neoplasm, although I don't have uh, facts and figures to back that up. Another tumor that I'm quite interested in is tumors of uh, donogenic origin, uh, uh, amyloblastoma and odontomas. Uh, the tumors of odontogenic origin originate from the uh, 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 odontogenic epithelium, which is the dental lamina. Uh, the dental lamina uh, originates by an invagination of the oral ectoderm, uh, and uh, in during uh, odontogenesis is re responsible for initiating the rather complex series of uh, events that lead to uh, tooth formation. Uh, the thing to remember is that, this, uh, that tumors of odontogenic origin are usually tumors uh, that contain at least a portion uh, of, of epithelial uh, tissue. Amyloblastoma is the proper diagnosis uh, for uh, uh, invasive, uh, locally invasive uh, tumors which have uh, an epithelial component uh, uh, which resembles odontogenic epithelium and lacks differentiation of uh, definitive uh, dental hard substances. These tumors are usually, as the name suggests, uh, uh, or as the descriptors suggest, uh, are uh, locally invasive tumors uh, associated with bone lysis. They can either occur superficially and grow outward into the oral cavity, but more commonly in dogs and cats, they occur uh, deep, uh, so-called central amyloblastoma uh, uh, within either the maxilla or the mandible uh, associated with uh, deeply expansile masses with a lot of bony lysis. On gross examination, they can either be solid, or, but very commonly they have, uh, they have uh, cysts within the solid uh, areas of the tumor. Again, the hallmark is uh, discovering uh, epithelial tissue with the char characteristic features of odontogenic epithelium. Tumors of odontogenic epithelium that go on to uh, differentiate into uh, definitive uh, dental matrices, uh, either osteoid or uh, uh, enamel, uh, should then properly be called odontoma, and there are a variety of different types of odontoma. The most well-differentiated types would be the complex and compound odontoma. I have an absolute mental block against just remembering which is which, but I think the ones that go on to form actual tooth-like structures are, are complex odontomas. You should put that in your notes with an asterisk, though, because uh, I have to look it up. Uh, I have to be looking at the name uh, when I do the talk, uh, otherwise I, I get them mixed up. This would be an example of a, of a uh, neoplasm, of, of, of well-differentiated uh, neoplasm of uh, odontogenic origin, where you have actual formation of little tooth-like structures, or they're sometimes referred to as denticles. These are tumors that invariably occur in young dogs. I've not seen them in cats. We see uh, very similar tumors in young horses occasionally and then they've been reported in a variety of other uh, a uh, animals as well. Uh, I think it could, uh, it often is, and it could uh, quite reasonably argue uh, that these, would, these are, are hamartomatous uh, lesions and not uh, overtly neoplastic lesions. This, although this slide uh, is, uh, uh, was lent to me a long time ago by Dr. Brody at the University of Pennsylvania, and this particular dog, uh, uh, quite, a lot of quite a bit of time after this tumor was resected, went on to develop a mal malignant carcinoma at this site. So, uh, that would, uh, the, the, the history of this particular dog might indicate that these tumors are, uh, have a greater malignant potential than anybody's uh, given them credit for. This is a radiograph of one of these uh, uh, dogs now with a uh, compound odontoma, uh, space occupying mass here radiographically. It, ha it shows complex formation of uh, radio opaque uh, uh, calcified material. If you make a slab of that uh, uh, radiograph now, uh, I, I believe this is the hard palate uh, and this is the area where the tumor was. You can see these ribbons of uh, well uh, uh, mineralized, uh, uh, mainly uh, dentinal matrix. Uh, 
but no tendency to form actual tooth-like structures, although the uh, dental matrix is, is, uh, is well differentiated, in some cases fully differentiated, uh, there's no tendency to form actual little denticles or identifiable tooth-like structures. Again, almost always uh, uh, tumors of uh, young uh, animals, whereas the meloblastoma is, uh, uh, there is no predilection that I'm aware of uh, to form tumors in, in, in young animals. Okay, tooth loss is an, is an interesting subject uh, as uh, veterinary dentistry becomes more and more a field of its own uh, 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 interventive uh, therapy to prevent or to ameliorate the uh, biological uh, phenomena that occur uh, and lead to tooth loss uh, becomes more and more important. Uh, uh, so I've become interested recently in uh, trying to, uh, to find out exactly what are the phenomena that lead to tooth loss in uh, uh, dogs and cats. and it's, and it's turned out to be a, a pretty interesting uh, disease. In most uh, of the literature, uh, periodontal inflammatory disease uh, or periodontitis is emphasized as a cause of uh, tooth loss in, uh, in, in dogs and cats, and I think appropriately so. Certainly, uh, uh, tartar accumulation and uh, uh, gingival recession uh, and, and alveolar bone recession are a uh, common phenomenon that lead to tooth loss, although uh, uh, it appears that uh, uh, there, uh, there are at least other phenomena that, are, that coexist with it and possibly exist as uh, entities on their own. This is an entity that hasn't found its way uh, very much into the veterinary pathology literature, although uh, veterinary dentists are, are, are well aware of it. And it's a lesion which goes by a variety of different names, uh, probably most correctly called the external osteoclastic resorptive lesion. Sometimes it's referred to as neck lesions. It's been also been called root caries, although I don't like that term because it really is not caries. This uh, phenomenon uh, becomes a clinical entity uh, because of uh, uh, unusual behavior during mastication and, and oral pain. These animals will be reluctant to chew. They'll show uh, peculiar masticatory uh, movements and peculiar, peculiar uh, saliva uh, formation. They'll occasionally be drooling. As a clinical entity, again, the hallmark of this disease is finding areas of uh, uh, osteoclastic resorption uh, at the gum line, at the neck of the tooth. The neck of the tooth is, uh, is the area just deep to where the uh, enamel crown uh, is. So osteoclastic absorption in that, in that area. This, just on, on general uh, examination, these lesions can be difficult to detect because they're usually covered by, uh, by the gum. So it takes rather uh, vigorous uh, uh, probing to detect these lesions. One of the hall uh, hallmarks of uh, this disease is on, on probing with a hard dental probe, uh, the depths of these uh, uh, sockets, so these resorptive sockets, uh, are fully mineralized uh, as opposed to caries, uh, which is a disease of uh, uh, decalcification of the dental subs, uh, acid decalcification of the dental tissues, uh, and the depths of a carious lesion will be soft. So these are, are very hard. They're also very painful. Even cats on, under light uh, plane of anesthesia are reported to twitch when these uh, lesions are probed. Okay, that's the presentation of these lesions as a clinical phenomenon. When you actually take jaws from uh, cats uh, at necropsy and uh, radiograph them or do dental examinations on them, these lesions occur quite commonly in animals in which uh, there is no, at least no written history uh, of, uh, of oral problems. I've never attempted to go back and find out if there were uh, uh, oral problems in, in, in these cats. Uh, uh, that's more work than I, uh, I'd be willing to put into it. This is that same tooth uh, cleaned up a little bit more, and you can see uh, uh, that's the, the edge of the lesion right there, and you can see how much destruction of the tooth there is. Uh, this is a, these are the teeth that were extracted from another uh, cat, and you can see it almost looks like these, uh, the lesions in these teeth were dynamited out. Uh, they're very uh, abrupt osteoclastic, uh, areas of osteoclastic resorption of the tooth. Okay, it becomes more interesting, uh, like I say, if you take a series of uh, just uh, 
consecutive cats in the, in the necropsy room and radiograph their jaws, uh, looking for areas of external osteoclastic resorption, uh, you find an interesting phenomenon, and that is that osteoclastic resorption is much more common than, than the uh, clinical disease that we just discussed. And, and the majority of osteoclastic resorption that we see in cats doesn't occur so much at the, uh, uh, at the neck of the tooth, but uh, deeper down in the roots. Uh, so, in fact, uh, the, uh, uh, the third premolar tooth, uh, which is the tooth that's most frequently lost in the cat, will, will often have a, uh, a lesion like this where you can see just remnants of the root tissue and, and the rest replaced by uh, uh, resorbed tissue. Uh, once the tooth, uh, once there's been osteoclastic resorption of the tooth root, uh, uh, there will be, just as there is in bone remodeling, there will be uh, uh, ingrowth and, and formation of osteon bone, which replaces the tooth root. Uh, so you have a process, a secondary process of ossification. As long as that's not occurring at the gum line, where this can break through and be exposed to the oral surface, uh, that ossification will go on to become complete, and eventually the crown of the tooth will drop off. And, and, uh, 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 and I think that uh, uh, ossification, osteoclastic resorption with ossification of the roots is, is one of the most common cause of, causes of uh, 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 tooth loss, particularly in the premolar teeth. Oh, there was another point. Well, actually, I'll make it on another slide. This is one of those lesions uh, that's broken through now. We have inflammatory disease. Notice the scalloping of the, uh, of the dentin. This is the uh, uh, root, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the dental pulp here, dental pulp here. Uh, we're at the uh, junction the, of the two roots, one root here, one root there, and we have this osteoclastic lesion extending into the uh, dentin. Uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the neck area of the tooth. Uh, uh, histologically, it's filled in with very loose uh, inflammatory connective tissue, and you can still recognize the osteoclastic uh, Hauschips lacuni-like uh, structures. If you're a purist, you can call these the dentoclastic uh, 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 Hauschips lacuni. Uh, uh, and it doesn't particularly matter. Even in here, you can recognize that there is some osteoid uh, being deposited. Uh, I, uh, you could argue that this is, in fact, cementum that's being deposited, since there's no way to really distinguish between these matrices. Uh, 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 there's a, there are a lot of opinions as to exactly which cells are responsible for, for this reaction. A little bit higher magnification, osteoclast. This is dental matrix, which would remain fully mineralized. This would be fully mineralized dental matrix uh, uh, with osteoclastic resorption. And here you can see this osteoid, newly deposited osteoid. Uh, 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 a, a process of turnover very similar to what you'd find in bone remodeling. Okay, as it turns out, uh, not only is there osteoclastic resorption of the alveolar bone and the, uh, uh, and the roots, uh, but uh, in, as cats age, the osteoclastic reaction uh, uh, consumes the alveolar bone, and even in very old cats, you have uh, resorption of the, uh, of the uh, cortex. And, and I've uh, particularly studied, since the mandible is much easier to assess radiographically, I've uh, confined my studies mainly to the mandible. This is a uh, histologic section from that same tooth. Uh, you can recognize the ossification of uh, what used to be the roots here in this third premolar tooth. So I think this is a disease that, uh, be, that, you'll, that there will be more uh, written about as we, as we go on. This is a different tooth now, a undecalcified one millimeter section uh, radiographed uh, showing that same phenomenon, ossification, first external resorption and then ossification of the roots of the, of the premolar tooth, the crown has been lost, uh, and uh, beginning of uh, uh, osteoclastic resorption of the uh, rostral portion of the cortex as well. Oops. Just for comparison, this is a the, the same uh, technique uh, applied to a two-year-old cat without osteoclastic resorption. <coughs> this is a uh, dog that uh, died for reasons other than oral disease. Uh, uh, you can uh, recognize the uh, jaundice color here. Uh, I believe there was an autoimmune hemolytic anemia in this dog. I photographed the jaw because of the uh, lesions that you see on the teeth here, and that is, uh, those are the lesions of enamel hypoplasia. This is a lesion that would have been present in this dog from the time of eruption of the permanent teeth, and, and it's an indication that the dog was infected with canine distemper virus uh, 
during the time of odontogenesis of the permanent teeth. So in, uh, proper enamel formation has never occurred uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a segmental area of the teeth, the enamel formation failed to occur in uh, this dog. In the old uh, German literature where this uh, condition was first described, they did a very careful analysis of the uh, exact uh, wave of enamel hypoplasia in all the teeth and compared that embryologically to the period of time uh, uh, when odontogenesis occurred in that particular portion of the tooth and, and showed that uh, uh, throughout the jaw the, uh, the lesions match in terms of a temporal sequence. Uh, uh, their conclusion was that uh, the secondary phenomena from uh, uh, distemper infection, uh, uh, nutritional factors, fever, uh, uh, and, and things like that were responsible for poor enamel formation. But in fact, uh, all you have to do is have a puppy that has that, that dies from, say, for instance, uh, uh, respiratory or uh, uh, GI or, or even neurological uh, distemper and, uh, sec and decalcify and section in. So you're looking at the developing uh, permanent teeth. And uh, if you do that, you can fairly, uh, oftentimes you can fairly easily see that there is a disruption of the enamel organ. This is the enamel organ of the developing permanent tooth. Uh, uh, these would be the ameloblasts here. Uh, this matrix that's deposited here is dentin produced by the odontoblasts, which are these cells in this area right here. Normally, the ameloblasts form a very regular uh, uh, palisading line of epithelial cells. And you can see in this cells that there's cystic degeneration, jumbling of the, of the ameloblasts. Uh, and I think I have a higher magnification. Yeah, this is that same tooth. You can see there's syncytial giant cell formation. And uh, if you're careful, you can also see in, recognize numerous uh, intracytoplasmic uh, eosinophilic inclusions, typical of distemper virus uh, uh, inclusions. And by electron microscopy, you can uh, fairly easily recognize distemper virions. Uh, in those cells uh, which are derived from ameloblastic epithelium. So there is a specific canine distemper virus infection of the uh, ameloblastic epithelium or the epithelial cells of the, of the uh, enamel organ in, in uh, uh, the developing adult teeth of dogs that leads to enamel hypoplasia. OK, working our way down the GI tract. Uh, in the esophagus. Any time that you have a dog in, in which vomition is an important part of its uh, clinical syndrome, it's uh, very important to look at, uh, at the esophagus. Uh, dogs are, uh, and cats too for that matter, are uh, very susceptible to reflux esophagitis uh, associated with uh, stomach acids uh, being exposed to esophageal mucosa. It's not that unusual to find a picture like this where you actually have uh, uh, acid digestion of the uh, esophagus with esophageal perforation. This then leads to a non-septic, uh, irritative uh, uh, pleural effusion. One of the characteristic features is they have this very digested appearance of the, of the extraesophageal uh, tissues. That, uh, they sort of crumble in your hand. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, if you do an, uh, an aspirate, uh, if a clinical pathologist gets a hand on the fluid from one of these animals, uh, this disease is diagnosable by aspiration of the pleural effusion that occurs because uh, it, uh, it appears that uh, in addition to stomach acids up here, you probably also have uh, 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 proteolytic enzymes such as trypsin uh, uh, because uh, you get auto digestion of the tish soft tissues of, of the uh, anterior mediastinum, and you can actually find fragments of nerves, fragments of, of uh, uh, blood vessels, uh, much like if you did a trypsin digest of, of a tissue like a retina or something uh, uh, floating free in the, in the, uh, uh, in the pleural fluid in, in these cases. Histologically, that reaction is very unrewarding because uh, really you're just looking at digested tissues. Uh, and and uh, any inflammatory response that occurs in that area uh, uh, probably gets digested along with everything else. Uh, so histologically, uh, looking at a uh, tissue like this, particularly the tissues around the esophagus, is, is quite unrewarding. In the earlier stages of this disease where you have erosions, uh, histologically, you will recognize a, a rather profound inflammatory uh, response. I'm, uh, in animals, uh, we frequently get animals, uh, as I'm sure everybody does, uh, 
that are uh, in a rather advanced degree of autolysis, and I'm not a person that spends a lot of time uh, opening intestines from uh, autolyzed uh, 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 guts, if, particularly if I don't think there's likely to be GI disease. I always insist, though, that we open the stomach because you never know what you're going to find uh, in, the, in the stomach of a dog. This particular one had 93 cents, so that kept me going. <laughs> that kept me going for a long time, uh, curious about what you find in, in the stomach. Okay, a lot of the diseases I've chosen uh, because they're the diseases that we see fairly commonly as important diseases, uh, uh, and uh, there tends to be a, in in those uh, in in dogs and cats uh, in those diseases there tends to be a bias towards cancer. We see a lot of cancer in uh, uh, in dogs and cats. One of the uh, more common uh, malignant neoplasms that we see in the postmortem room is uh, gastric carcinoma. Gastric carcinoma tends to be uh, a, a disease associated with uh, gastric thickening. Uh, clinically, these dogs are, uh, will vomit uh, shortly after uh, eating. Uh, the vomitus will come from the stomach. Uh, radiographically, these can be uh, sus suspected uh, because the stomach uh, wall becomes quite rigid. Uh, 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 fibrosis and thickening is a very common uh, phenomenon in these tumors, and, and the uh, uh, appearance of the gastric mucosa will not change uh, 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 depending upon whether the animal is eaten or over time. Uh, and this can be recognized quite nicely, especially with contrast studies uh, uh, radiographically. So we usually get a fairly accurate diagnosis of these uh, tumors uh, at the time that we do, uh, do, the, uh, do the autopsy. They're usually fairly easily recognizable. These days, we have a lot of dogs that come to the necropsy room after having uh, 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 fiber optics, uh, uh, biopsy techniques, uh, 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 gastroscopy, uh, gastroscopy uh, uh, acquired uh, biopsies, uh, and, uh, and, and that's a good way to, to diagnose this disease uh, as well. We get a lot of non-diagnostic gastric biopsies, but uh, we do occasionally uh, hit upon those in, in which we can give them a useful diagnosis, and this is one of those diseases where we can be quite helpful uh, with gastric biopsy. The uh, tumor is quite characteristic uh, grossly. Uh, you can see fairly normal uh, rugi here in the fundic stomach. In this particular case, in the pyloric stomach, you can see a, a, a a poorly delineated area of uh, change. Uh, deep uh, ulceration is a common phenomenon. Occasionally, we see, we'll see these dogs that have uh, full thickness ulceration with peritoni secondary peritonitis, but more commonly, they have deep crater form ulcers which extend into the uh, tumor. And the hallmark of the disease is the uh, invasive nature of this tumor. This is a highly invasive tumor, and you'll see uh, uh, not only uh, malignant epithelial cells in the gastric mucosa, but also a profound desmoplastic uh, uh, proliferative response uh, that uh, in, invades in, into the submucosa, the muscularis, and as well, you can see them tracking along the, the uh, lymphatics on the cirrhosal surface of the stomach. Uh, and uh, uh, rigid, tightly attached, immobile, uh, immobile lymph nodes uh, uh, along the uh, omental attachments uh, uh, are a, uh, uh, something I like to look for in the diagnosis of uh, gastric carcinoma. The most uh, common site for this to occur is in the pyloric antrum, but we will occasionally see these tumors in the fundus. Uh, and uh, uh, although uh, they are quite characteristic, as soon as you start to get, uh, when you're dealing with cancer in, in animals, as soon as you start to get cocky about something, then something comes along to, to fool you. And uh, this is a dog that had uh, a deep crater form uh, uh, ulcer with a firm, rigid uh, gastric uh, uh, wall. And I made the diagnosis of gastric carcinoma fairly confidently, only to have this come back as lymphosarcoma, which is a, should always be considered on the, on the uh, differential uh, diagnosis. Okay, moving on to lymphosarcoma, we do see lymphosarcoma as a uh, tumor of the GI tract uh, in, in uh, both dogs and cats, uh, probably more commonly in cats than in dogs, uh, and this is a gastric form of lymphosarcoma in a, in a cat. I'm sorry, that's not a gastric. This is a small intestinal, regional small intestinal lymphosarcoma in a cat. Uh, we see, and probably most of you are familiar with uh, the, the fairly normal tissues that we see. Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. 
and other ones are coming up. Moving on down the GI tract, uh, in uh, both dogs and cats, but more commonly in dogs, we see uh, a variety of diseases associated with in inflammatory uh, uh, and proliferative lesions of the uh, uh, intestine. Uh, most often these diseases are associated with uh, uh, wasting diseases with chronic uh, low-grade diarrhea. Uh, sometimes there'll be uh, documented protein loss with uh, these diseases as well. When you autopsy an animal uh, uh, with a disease like that, what you characteristically will find is a sort of a shag rug appearance to the mucosal surface of the intestine. What you're looking at here are the individual villi. Sometimes the villi will have an opaque white appearance, uh, suggesting that there is retention of some of the chylus uh, uh, lipid-filled uh, fluid uh, within the lacteal of the, of the villus, uh, but oftentimes the, the uh, color will be more of a meaty uh, consistency without the, the uh, chylus uh, uh, retention uh, uh, that you see in this particular instance. Something must be missing here. Ah. One thing I like to look out for in this disease is uh, the presence of small uh, little granulomas that you find at, uh, stretching along the, uh, the lacteals. Uh, and you'll, the, the best place to look for that, for that is still within the serosal uh, surface of the bowel at the point of mesenteric attachment. And uh, these are areas where there's been a la uh, lacteal rupture uh, with uh, uh, accumulation of chylus uh, materials. So you have a chylus granuloma formation uh, right at the junction of the serosa and the, and the mesentery. And, and that's a hint that you've got uh, some sort of uh, obstructive disease of the lymphatic drainage system of, of the GI tract. OK, uh, if you have that phenomenon, if you have the little uh, chylus granulomas, then uh, it's quite dependable that you're going to have uh, 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 lymphatic dilatation within the villus tip as well, or, or in other words, a true uh, lymphangiectasia. This is a, uh, a slow power photomicrograph showing the, the dilated lacteals within the, within the villus tip. Characteristically, an animal like this will have true protein losing. In other words, protein from the, from the, uh, from the lymph will be lost into the, uh, in, into the GI tract. And, and uh, these animals will uh, rapidly go into a protein-starved uh, uh, metabolism uh, uh, and uh, it would be a significant portion of, of their disease. If all you have is the proliferative enteritis with a shaggy appearance of the intestine, you could easily just as well have purely a lymphocytic plasmacytic uh, inflammatory infiltrate in the, in the lamina propria without lacteal dilatation. And uh, clinically, the, uh, the distinguish, distinction between these two animals, can, two uh, types of diseases can be uh, uh, pretty difficult, and, and the, we may be just looking at tempor, uh, temporal differences at, at, at times in some of these diseases, because uh, lymphangiectasia will fairly often have a uh, lymphocytic plasmacytic uh, inflammatory infiltrate uh, as part of the uh, phenomenon as well. In fact, lymphocyte accumulation within the dilated lacteals is one of the things, uh, characteristic features that we see in, in, uh, in this disease. Oh, that's just a little bit higher magnification of the dilated lacteal. In cats uh, that have uh, chronic diarrhea, and particularly uh, cats that are sort of have sort of hair trigger stomachs uh, uh, and do a, lo a lot of uh, vomiting, uh, stress vomiting, or uh, uh, postprandial vomiting. Uh, we often see a form of uh, chronic enteritis, uh, which is characterized uh, most prominently by muscular hypertrophy. These are sometimes referred to as garden hose guts because uh, they have a very rigid tubular uh, configuration. And the, and the hyper hypertrophy that you see in the smooth muscle uh, tunica muscularis in, in these intestines is quite prominent. Although the muscular hypertrophy is the uh, most striking uh, gross feature in these uh, animals, you will also see a uh, less proliferative uh, lymphocytic plasmacytic enteritis in the lamina propria uh, of these cats as well. Uh, as far as I'm aware of, uh, uh, nobody has suggested uh, uh, a pathogenesis of this disease, although we see it fairly commonly, uh, and uh, I suspect we'd see it even more commonly if, uh, I don't think these are animals that very frequently make it to, to the postmortem room because of their disease. They have uh, 
diseases that makes them a nuisance, but it's not usually a, a fatal disease. And yet, the clinician can fairly easily palpate the, the, the presence of these garden hose guts or these uh, ropey uh, consistence, uh, consistency intestines uh, in, in the cat. So it would be an interesting disease to study uh, in terms of pathogenesis. Several years ago, I uh, uh, published a, a series of cases in, of uh, dogs that have a lesion like this. Uh, this is, these are characteristically our, our dogs uh, in which there is a fluid accumulation in the, in the abdominal cavity, and then uh, on gross examination, you find uh, intestines which are uh, bunched together, uh, apparently trapped by a fibrous membrane. Uh, these can be angry looking uh, red lesions, but the characteristic feature is the opacification of the serosal surfaces and, and bunching together of the uh, 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 serosal surfaces of the intestine. Occasionally, uh, more so than the intestine, the omentum will be what's trapped here. This is not a solid mass here. This is a, a fibrous membrane pulling the omental fat together. So if you cut across this lesion, uh, the bulk of what's white in here would, uh, in fact, be the trapped lipid. Uh, but now you can see the spleen has been pulled to the greater curvature of the stomach and held fairly uh, rigidly. Uh, it's fairly common uh, if a surgeon goes in and looks at this to uh, think that, uh, that uh, this condition is chronic inflammatory disease, and you can see why it has all the hallmarks of chronic inflammatory disease, redness uh, and fibrosis. Uh, but in fact, uh, in the postmortem room, you should probably think first of cancer as, a, a, as this disease uh, form of uh, carcinomatosis. Uh, I had the chance to look, to look at quite a few dogs like this, and, uh, and um, I came to the conclusion that these are tumor, actually tumors of, of the uh, Mesothelium. I call it uh, the disease sclerosing mesothelioma. Uh, there's some di rather disturbing facts about this. It's almost invariably a disease of male dogs. Uh, uh, in the tw uh, we have e eventually ended up with 12 of these, and 11 of the 12 uh, were uh, tumors in, in male dogs. Uh, and we know that prostatic carcinoma can be a highly invasive tumor in the abdominal cavity. So most of these dogs, I looked fairly carefully at the prostate and failed to identify presence of malignancies in the, in the prostate, uh, although I think it behooves you to to look very carefully. Certainly you can see carcinomatosis from other cancers that would cause a very similar uh, response with, desma, uh, with tumor desmoplasia, uh, fibrous uh, connective tissue proliferation around adjacent to malignant epithelial cells uh, that would give you an identical uh, appearance. But the bottom line here uh, is that uh, you should probably think first of cancer when you see a uh, a, a lesion associated with dense proliferation of uh, what appears to be fibrovascular connective tissue on cirrhosal surfaces in the abdominal cavity. Occasionally we'll see it in the thoracic cavity as well. That's one of the reasons why I stick to the, my guns that this is in fact a tumor of mesothelial origin, a variation of mesothelioma. This is what you see histologically in these tumors a profound desmoplastic proliferation, of uh, uh, bizarre inner branching, sometimes stellate mesenchymal cells, and then little clusters of uh, often cyst-forming epithelial or, uh, if I'm correct, mesothelial uh, uh, cells. Sometimes the distinction between the epithelial and, and the surrounding mesenchymal cells uh, can be hard to make. And of course, that's true when you have uh, uh, scurrous carcinoma of other tissues as well. Another tumor which is notorious for its local infiltration in both dogs and cats uh, are tumors of the pancreas. Uh, uh, we see highly invasive neoplasia associated with pancreatic carcinoma. Uh, what we don't usually see is uh, large space occupying masses that occur uh, within the pancreas. So uh, in the early stages of the disease, distinct the distinction between a proliferative uh, uh, inflammatory disease of the pancreas and pancreatic carcinoma can be difficult. And, uh, and often this leads to problems in exploratory uh, laparotomy. If you, have a, uh, a lesion associated with cholestasis, for instance, uh, and a palpable mass in the anterior abdomen uh, or a radiographically detectable suspicious mass in the anterior abdomen. A surgeon might have a lot of difficulty uh, looking at a pancreas like that and making a determination. Uh, and of course, sur surgery on the pancreas is hard to do. This uh, pancreatic carcinoma is a tumor which has a predilection to metastasize to the liver. And in, in, in a lot of cases, the, uh, the tumor metastasis to the liver is much more profound and uh, uh, catches your eye uh, uh, than, the, uh, than the primary tumor. You may have thickening uh, and suggestive areas in, in the pancreas itself, uh, but a profound infiltration uh, uh, in the liver tissue. I told you I wasn't going to talk about the liver, but 
occasionally it crops up when you, even when you try and keep it out. Uh, this is pancreatic carcinoma in the liver of a cat. Just another example on cut surface pancreatic carcinoma in the liver of a dog. A profound replacement of normal hepatic tissue by uh, tan, slightly bulging neoplastic infiltrate. Uh, well, one thing I like to look at uh, if you, if you, when, you, when you have the hyalus of the liver intact is to palpate very carefully for uh, skewers thickening of the, of the lymphatics uh, extending from the uh, pancreas to the, to the liver because lymphatic invasion with ropey firm cord-like uh, lymphatic thickening uh, is a common phenomenon with uh, pancreatic carcinoma. And then uh, occasionally we'll find the carcinomatosis of the abdominal cavity as well. Uh, in cats, uh, interestingly, uh, carcinomatosis of the lymphatics of the omentum is a, is a fairly uh, frequent uh, sequelae to pancreatic carcinoma. Looks quite a bit different. Uh, uh, at least this form of carcinomatosis of the, of the abdomen looks quite a bit different from that skewerous carcinomatosis that we had in the, in the uh, tumors, which I call uh, sclerosing mesothelioma or desmoplastic mesothelioma. Another tumor in which we uh, fairly frequently have a positive diagnosis of uh, uh, at the time, a fairly reliable diagnosis of at the time of necropsy are functional tumors of the, of the en uh, endocrine pancreas. Tumors of the, uh, the cells of the islets of Langerhans uh, uh, that uh, secrete uh, hormones uh, uh, can often be diagnosed uh, uh, by uh, clinical evaluation. The most common uh, syndrome that we see are insulin secreting tumors and the clinical syndrome that we see then uh, is, are uh, tumors with an episodic hypoglycemia. These are animals that uh, are characterized by uh, episodes of uh, usually neurological disease, although hyperexcitability can be part of the problem, and associated with a profound hypoglycemia in the face of a high blood insulin level. So uh, the insulin glucose ratio is quite important in making this diagnosis. With a proper clinical workup, the, there's almost always an accurate diagnosis in these, and we see a fair amount of these uh, resected at uh, the time of necropsy, I mean, uh, uh, resected in surgery. Uh, as is quite characteristic of endocrine tumors in other parts of the body, uh, these tumors sometimes uh, have a fairly uh, well-differentiated histological appearance, which belies a, a malignant uh, 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 biological behavior. Although these tumors are malignant, they seldom cause clinical problems due to their size. They're usually uh, one to two to three centimeter uh, localized nodules uh, in one of the other arms of the, of the pancreas. Uh, uh, and uh, the clinical disease that they, that they cause is associated with the uh, endocrine function of these tumors. The biological behavior is for reoccurrence of clinical signs to occur, and, and the reoccurrence is associated then with uh, uh, the uh, uh, establishment of a, of a functional tumor mass in a site distant from the uh, original tumor. Uh, regional lymph nodes, spleen, and liver are the three areas uh, where you most commonly will find uh, establishment of secondary uh, functional uh, uh, foci. Insulin secreting tumors or insulinoma is the most common uh, phenomenon we see, but we will occasionally see gastrin secreting tumors and, and uh, uh, glucagon secreting tumors, uh, each with their own uh, uh, increasingly more recognizable uh, clinical syndrome uh, uh, associated with them. Inflammatory diseases of the pancreas. Uh, the most common inflammatory disease of the pancreas we see is acute necrotizing pancreatitis associated with extensive abdominal pain, peritonitis. Uh, uh, the pathogenesis of acute necrotizing pancreatitis in dogs and cats is, is not very well understood. Uh, uh, the significance of the disease is quite important. Uh, uh, it's a very important consideration when, uh, uh, for uh, uh, surgeons that have to do manipulative procedures in the anterior abdomen. Uh, it can also be a secondary phenomena for, uh, associated with other diseases, either malignant, inflammatory uh, uh, diseases of the anterior uh, abdomen. But most commonly, it's seen as a, as a syndrome by itself. Uh, tends to occur in small uh, breeds of dogs. Uh, there's almost certainly a dietary 
uh, predilection. Uh, 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 so these diseases can be controlled by uh, uh, moderation of the diet, uh, bland uh, foods uh, fed frequently throughout the day in a very strict, uh, strictly controlled uh, uh, manner uh, in, in dogs that are predisposed to epizootic uh, acute pancreatitis. As opposed to the acute pancreatitis, we do occasionally see dogs in the postmortem room that have a chronic atrophic pancreatitis uh, and will end up with a pancreas uh, uh, like this, a very small pancreas with little islands of uh, preserved exocrine pancreatic tissue uh, with the rest of the pancreas being uh, atrophied. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen a dog with uh, 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 chronic uh, atrophic pancreatitis that has suffered from clinical uh, deficiency of uh, pancreatic uh, exocrine function. As you can see in this dog, we have a well uh, uh, fatted dog. This is a, this is a, these are usually an incidental finding, even when they're severe like this uh, and, and rather profound. Uh, they're usually an incidental finding uh, uh, at the dog. Uh, unlike acute uh, suppurative and necrotizing pancreatitis, the inflammation in these dogs is uh, almost centered, almost always centered around the bile ducts uh, with uh, atrophy, a profound atrophy of the uh, exocrine tissue. Although if you section just these remaining little lobules, the exocrine pancreas appears normal. Nor have I seen an association with uh, loss of endocrine function in these dogs. Uh, dogs with recurrent uh, acute necrotizing pancreatitis uh, uh, are at risk of uh, developing uh, uh, diabetes mellitus due to uh, dysfunction of the endocrine pancreas. Uh, I've not recognized that phenomenon in, in dogs with, I've not recognized chronic atrophic pancreatitis as being a predisposing uh, factor in diabetes mellitus. We don't seem to autopsy that many cases of diabetes mellitus as we used to, now that I think about it. Unlike uh, atrophic pancreatitis, uh, pancreatic hypoplasia is a disease uh, which is characteristically associated with uh, uh, maldigestion due to insufficient exocrine pancreas function. Uh, these diseases are usually breed related and occur in young dogs. What appears to happen is that the pancreas uh, uh, develops uh, uh, to a functional extent and then undergoes a, uh, a profound atrophy. In these animals, what you see is a uh, uniform pa uh, pancreatic atrophy. Uh, there is pancreatic tissue recognizable in, in this little slit there, uh, but mainly what you're looking at is a pancreatic duct and then blood vessels uh, associated with it. The islet tissue remains uh, normal. This particular, uh, the uh, ones that I've seen most commonly because there was a, uh, the University of Pennsylvania uh, had for a period of time a, a colony of them were in, uh, uh, what's the big black dog, uh, Newfoundland, Newfoundlands. Okay, we'll uh, start from the front and uh, work our way down the respiratory tract. And uh, a fairly uh, common disease for us to see are fungal infections of the, of the nasal cavity. Uh, we uh, get, uh, with the advent of various biopsy techniques, we get a lot of uh, surgical biopsies of uh, nasal tissue. And, we, and just like in the gastric biopsies, we end up with a lot of uh, diagnoses, which I don't think are very helpful, chronic nonspecific inflammatory disease. Uh, but we will be uh, useful on, oca uh, on occasion, and that is uh, when, we, when we find neoplasms or when we find uh, fungal infections. And we don't get a chance to autopsy very many of these fungal, uh, fungal uh, rhinitis dogs, but when we do, they're quite characteristic. We have uh, uh, destructive uh, 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 rhinitis, and in this case, also sinusitis, uh, associated with a thick, uh, uh, opaque, tan, uh, dry, exudate, uh, much like fungal disease in the air sac of a bird or uh, in uh, a variety of other uh, uh, species. The other disease in which we're helpful uh, in making a diagnosis are uh, neoplasms of the nasal cavity. Uh, again, dogs and cats are fairly similar in terms of, ne uh, in my experience anyway, of ne uh, neoplasms of the nasal cavity. Uh, there's a wide variety of different types of neoplasms that you'll see. Curiously, um, uh, most of the tumors of the nasal cavity that you see uh, have very similar biological behavior, and that is that they are locally uh, aggressive and infiltrative, but are unlikely to metastasize distantly. Basically, they can be divided into two groups, epithelial and mesenchymal. Uh, the epithelial tumors uh, are probably uh, correctly uh, uh, distinguished by uh, by their degree of differentiation. We have uh, uh, poorly differentiated or anaplastic tumors. We have some, a few that differentiate into stratified squamous epithelium, a few that remain recognizable as respiratory epithelium and, and take on a more papillary and less solid uh, configuration. Uh, 
Uh, and then we have mesenchymal tumors of either cartilage or bone that occur in the, in the nasal cavity. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, uh, uh, all of the tumors of the nasal cavity are potentially locally invasive, destroying the tissues of the nasal cavity, but are unlikely to metastasize. And for this reason, they, uh, the uh, oncologists now are getting uh, quite aggressive in terms of their treatment of the, of the local disease, uh, both with surgical uh, exoneration uh, of the nasal cavity and with uh, radiation and chemotherapy to, uh, uh, to, to treat these tumors. And we're seeing dogs that have uh, uh, greatly increased life expectancy, although we're, we're beginning to see a, a variety of secondary diseases associated with surgical and, and radiation effects on the, on the uh, head. And, and no, I don't believe I've ever seen a mesenchymal tumor do this. Okay, it's uh, 11.30, so why don't we uh, break for lunch and we'll uh, start up again uh, with this slide. Uh, thank you. I'm curious to see if this little clock down here registers 13 hours or, or 1 o'clock. Okay, we we're working our way down the respiratory track of uh, cats and dogs. Uh, this is the uh, tympanic bulla of a, a cat opened up, and what we're looking at here is an uh, inflammatory polyp. I I'm sorry, this is the tympanic bulla of a cat opened up, and what we're looking at here is the uh, inflammatory polyp uh, working its way down the eustachian tube. Uh, these uh, proliferative inflammatory lesions uh, that originate in the, in the middle ear in cats uh, can go one of two directions. They can either uh, perforate through the uh, tym tymp tympanic membrane and extend out the uh, horizontal ear canal to in the external ear, or they can work their way down the eustachian tube uh, and uh, uh, exist as uh, space-occupying masses in the nasal pharynx uh, uh, region of the uh, uh, nose. Uh, uh, in either case, uh, as uh, diseases that, that break through the uh, eustachian tube, they're evident as space-occupying lesions in the ear and, uh, and can be associated with uh, uh, chronic otitis. Uh, and uh, oftentimes, these ones that are in the eustachian tube are, are clinically silent, but we have seen cases where they have led to obstruct either obstructive or uh, abnormal respiratory sounds uh, uh, when they produce space-occupying lesions in the, in the uh, nasopharynx. Uh, these are inflammatory lesions. They, originate with uh, uh, usually a suppurative, ulcerative uh, otitis media, and uh, they, um, uh, that forms the nidus of uh, granulation tissue, which becomes epithelialized. Uh, uh, they need to be distinguished uh, from uh, malignant neoplasms that can occur either in the middle ear or in the external ear canal, uh, and they're distinguished by the fibrovascular and chronic inflammatory nature of the stroma and the uh, important feature is finding uh, either respiratory or stratified squamous epithelium uh, covering the uh, surface of these lesions. Sometimes you have to look at several areas because they are commonly ulcerative uh, and uh, they don't, uh, oftentimes don't have an epithelium covering the entire lesion. If you have a kitten that has uh, uh, suppurative otitis media or uh, chronic suppurative rhinitis for whatever reason, probably usually originally virally, but, uh, viral, but when we uh, see these at autopsies, uh, by the time we see them, usually the viral etiology is no longer apparent. Uh, if you section the uh, middle ear, decalcify and section the middle ear, you can often find these uh, lesions uh, beginning as a very common phenomena. Ulceration and then fibrovascular connective tissue proliferation extending through the ulcerative uh, lesion in the epithelium of the, of the middle ear. Uh, here's the tympanic membrane uh, here. Okay, this is uh, a pretty obscure and rare disease, but uh, 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 has an interesting uh, history. This is a disease we see in young, uh, usually northern breed dogs, um, uh, Malmute, uh, Husky, Samoyed, uh, uh, whatnot. I've only experienced two of these in my career, so it's not a real common lesion. Uh, they uh, uh, create clinical disease because they obstruct the trachea. We, what we're looking at is a well-delineated, uh, localized, uh, uh, benign neoplastic lesion extending from the tracheal cartilage. And this is an osteochondroma. Osteochondroma is a, uh, a benign proliferative lesion. You could argue whether it's neoplastic or not. Uh, usually it occurs in the skeletal system. They can be multifocal. Sometimes they're referred to as uh, car uh, multifocal cartilaginous exostosis. Uh, and uh, histologically, the hallmark is uh, finding uh, uh, an inner association between osseous and cartilaginous tissue, which is reminent, reminiscent of a growth plate. Well, the same tumor can originate in the cartilage of the, of the tracheal ring. Uh, 
Th these are tumors of young animals. Uh, usually the tumor stops growing at about the same time growth plates close at the, and in the normal skeleton. And that's true, that seems to be true of the lesions that occur in the trachea uh, as well. Uh, however, in the, in the trachea lumen, uh, if they reach a size in which they impinge uh, on respiration, then they are uh, a clinical emergency. Oh, that's the same lesion, uh, uh, subgross section. Uh, uh, typical of what you'd see in the skeletal system as well, a rim of cartilage, excuse me, and then a zone uh, of ossification, which uh, histologically has a, a lot of uh, morphological similarity to a growth plate. Okay, moving on down the lungs. Uh, these are surgical uh, specimens, uh, and this is a disease we see uh, occasionally. Uh, I've only seen it in dogs, uh, and that is... Uh, uh, pneumothorax uh, associated with uh, uh, emphysematous bullous emphysema or emphysematous bully uh, in the uh, peripheral lung tissue. Uh, uh, a, a single lobe can be involved in some cases uh, several lobes are involved. Uh, usually they can be detected at the time of surgery and, and lobectomy or removal of the t affected tissue uh, leads uh, to a dog that can live the rest of its life uh, without any problem. They become a clinical problem when these, uh, these little bully uh, rupture leading to uh, a sudden pneumothorax. This is a radiograph uh, of those same uh, pieces of tissue. You can recognize quite nicely the little uh, bully of uh, tissue that are in there. Oh, never mind. When you look at them histologically, they are uh, lined by a al uh, uh, alveolar duct type respiratory epithelium. And uh, if you're lucky, you can, in, in these areas, you can find alveolar ducts extending into these bullous uh, lesions. Uh, I'm not sure. I think what happens is you get coalescence, coalescence of uh, peripheral uh, alveolar tissue and, and multiple alveolar ducts lead into the same uh, lesion. So I'm not uh, trying to say that we've uh, fortuitously cut right into the origin of this uh, bullous uh, lesion. but. Uh, they are, they do originate from a pathological distension of the, of the respiratory duct or terminal um, bronchiolar uh, airways. This is an incidental finding we'll occasionally see in, in dogs a little, usually these are lesions that occur near the hyalus and often on the ventral aspect of the lung lobes uh, and they consist of fairly sharply delineated areas of uh, consolidated lung tissue associated with a uh, uh, pallor. And uh, these can usually be identified uh, grossly. They're not, uh, I've never seen a case that's been associated with clinical disease. They've always been incidental findings at uh, necropsy. When you look at these uh, areas histologically, you see uh, filling of the alveolar uh, lumina. And under this magnification, you can't say too much more about it than that. But under higher magnification, especially with the PAS stain, you can recognize this PAS positive uh, uh, foreign material. Uh, in uh, bronchiolar and alveolar uh, airways, uh, and then associated with a secondary granulomatous inflammation. And this has been called a PAS positive granulomatous pneumonia of dogs. Uh, it's a lesion that only pathologists know about, and clinicians uh, are totally unaware of it, uh, for, and for good reasons, because it's not a lesion that's associated with disease. Uh, just a little bit higher magnification showing the granulomatous uh, reaction around these little uh, popcorn-like uh, uh, concretions. I'm not aware of anybody that really knows what this uh, stuff is. If you look at it with uh, using polarized light, you can uh, elicit a positive uh, birefringence uh, in that particulate uh, foreign material. Uh, oops, I thought I included another picture. There, uh, the I have a pet theory that this is uh, dust from uh, some of the pet uh, commercial pet dusting products that you use. Uh, most of them have a talc or a silica. Uh, base, but uh, a few of them have a, a, an organic, organic compound base, and if you sprinkle some of that on a glass slide and uh, either stain it with PAS or, or uh, look at it under polarized light, it has a very similar appearance, but uh, that's just sort of a pet theory of mine, that this is uh, inhaled uh, particulate material from some sort of dusting material. Okay, we see a lot of inflammatory uh, pneumonia in uh, dogs and cats. Uh, an awful lot of what we see is uh, secondary to uh, other uh, diseases leading to either immune suppression uh, due to chronic illness or, or debilitating illness, uh, or uh, probably even more so uh, uh, excessive aspiration or inappropriate aspiration associated with animals that are down in a cage or ill due to other reasons, or clinical manipulations that lead to uh, inappropriate uh, aspiration. So uh, 
uh, anterior ventral consolidating acute pneumonias uh, we'll see both as in incidental findings and as potentially fatal uh, disease uh, uh, if we get uh, enough uh, necrotization with septicemia in uh, some of those animals. Uh, less frequently, we'll find uh, uh, lungs that look like this, and this is probably more common in cats than dogs, but we'll see it in, in both, and that is an inner association with consolidated uh, lung tissue and then uh, uh, peripheral lung tissue, uh, more commonly dorsally, uh, uh, in which there's hyperinflation. And if you see this pattern of disease, then you should think of chronic airway disease, uh, chronic obstructive uh, airway disease of one, uh, one kind or another. The pathogenesis of this is really uh, not, not very, very well understood in uh, dogs, but uh, chronic bronchi uh, bronchitis, bronchiolitis. Uh, uh, usually you can culture a bacteria out of, out of these lungs, but uh, I'm not prepared to say that uh, any one particular bacteria is uh, important in the pathogenesis of this uh, uh, condition. Often if you open alveolar spaces, you can find a certain amount of uh, bronchiectasis, uh, uh, widening of the, of the bronchi, uh, uh, extending uh, peripherally into the uh, inflammatory uh, lung tissue, and hence, uh, partial obstruction leading to air trapping in, the, in, the, in other areas of the, of the lungs. So a combination of consolidation and uh, hyperinflation, uh, you should think of uh, chronic airway disease. Okay, this is something uh, we see quite a bit of in Wisconsin, uh, and this is uh, granulomatous pneumonia associated with blastomyces. We see uh, an interesting variety of patterns uh, of uh, lung disease in, uh, in this disease. Uh, uh, probably, and the ones we see in the postmortem room anyway, this is probably the most common configuration, a widespread, uh, diffuse, uh, uh, coalescing miliary uh, granulomatous pneumonia. If you look at these histologically, the granulomata actually originate uh, in the lumina of the, of the uh, bronchioles. Uh, other tissues that we uh, see that are affected with the organism, uh, in, in, uh, uh, well, the, the, the tissues that we see that are most commonly associated with, uh, with blastomyces infection are skin, lung, uh, eye, uh, and then further down on the list, uh, bone, and then further down still, just about any other tissue you can imagine. Uh, if you live long enough, you'll see blastomyces affecting any tissue in the, in the body. You'll rarely see it in the brain, although uh, we've seen it, it's a disease which affects uh, dogs much more frequently than cats, but when we see it in cats, so there, there seems to be a higher predilection for the disease to occur in the brain for some reason. The skin is particularly useful. If you think you might have a diagnosis, it's, it's worthwhile as a clinician or as a pathologist to spend some time parting the hair uh, looking for uh, ulcerative skin lesions, because usually what you find is a small draining lesion that's not very impressive uh, on gross examination. It's not a space occupying mass, and it's not a deeply ulcerative lesion. You can often be directed to the lesion by where the dog is licking, so spend some time uh, either asking the owners or watching the dog uh, to see uh, parts of the body where the dog might be licking. And the reason it's important is it, it gives you an easy avenue into diagnosis, because uh, cytology of an ulcerative skin lesion is a common uh, mechanism for diagnosis in, in these cases. Uh, we do have serological tests that are available, but uh, as serology often is, it's, uh, uh, we've had both false positive, tragic false positive and tragic false negatives, uh, uh, and uh, uh, lung radiography will uh, often demonstrate, uh, chest radiography will often demonstrate radiodense lesions, but uh, uh, that uh, uh, still leaves you with a differential diagnosis. Uh, uh, aspiration of lesions from the eyes has been a common mode of diagnosis in these cases, and they'll even do diagnostic enucleations in eyes that are, are, that are unsalvageable uh, anyway, uh, purely for the purpose of diagnosis and also to get rid of the pain and unsightliness of a severely affected eye. This is a fixed section from that. Uh, when you look at the tissues uh, on, on section, usually there's uh, a greater degree of consolidation and granulomatous involvement of the dorsal aspects of the lung fields than the ventral, for reasons I don't really understand. Uh, on the other hand, we'll, uh, uh, we not infrequently, we'll find localized solitary lesions. Uh, and you always have to be mindful. Uh, it, I mean, it, it's just another thing that uh, uh, makes you think of the differential diagnosis between granulomatous disease and neoplasia because uh, any of the patterns that I show here for blastomycosis uh, could be equally good for uh, for neoplasia. Numerous times I've uh, I've been proven wrong 
This is a pattern we'll see occasionally, the peripheral lung tissue being relatively spared, but uh, dense fibrovascular uh, proliferation around the hyalus. So the lymph nodes are trapped in this tissue, but the, but the thickened tissue doesn't really conform to the shape of the lymph nodes. So whether this is a lymphadenopathy that breaks beyond the lymphadenopathy or the lymph nodes are innocent bystanders and, and the lesion is strictly peri, peritracheal and peribronchial, uh, I, I really don't know, nor do I understand the uh, significance of this particular morphological variant of pulmonary blastomycosis. And then we find uh, other, other lesions that have, rather than the miliary small uh, coalescing granulomas, uh, large tumor-like uh, uh, lesions associated with granulomatous pneumonia and blastomycosis. I think I have to switch ahead. Oops. I had to switch ahead because I wasn't sure whether I had another picture of blastomycosis or, or uh, primary neoplasia. I've gotten into uh, uh, primary neoplasms. We, we see, a, uh, in our uh, biopsy service, we see a fair number of uh, uh, primary neoplasms of the thoracic cavity. We do not see that many in, uh, in our uh, necropsy service. I don't know uh, if that reflects some success in the treatment of these animals or uh, the fact that uh, they uh, don't, after having the diagnosis, they go back to a referring veterinarian and don't come back in for, don't die in the hospital and don't come back in for necropsy. It's real difficult to put these uh, things together and come to an understanding of the biological behavior of, of neoplasia uh, in, in animals because of our relatively poor record keeping and uh, access to follow-up information. But we do see fairly commonly, particularly in a biopsy service, uh, uh, large uh, solitary uh, Bronchoalveolar carcinoma is far and away the most common in both the dog and cat. Uh, these are tumors that usually originate in the per, uh, peripheral uh, parenchyma of the lung, and uh, although the morphology of the tissue is quite variable, uh, usually you can recognize uh, epithelial tissue reminiscent of uh, respiratory epithelium. We do see squamous cell carcinomas, and they do tend to occur more in the large bronchi, just as they do in, in, uh, in humans. Sometimes, and more frequently in cats than dogs, we will see a more miliary pattern, very much like what we see in, I mean, this could be uh, blastomycosis or granulomatous pneumonia due to other deep mycoses, uh, but uh, this turns out to be uh, primary bronchoalveolar carcinoma. Uh, another good diagnosis for this in a cat would be a metastatic mammary carcinoma. We do also see benign tumors uh, uh, of the lung, uh, uh, I do uh, a procedure uh, where I'll uh, take the lung tissue, carefully harvest the lung tissue without perforating and then inflate it and take uh, uh, post-mortem radiographs of the lung tissue. If you do that procedure, you can commonly find these little cystic uh, 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 lesions in the lung uh, that are associated with a benign pol uh, neoplastic proliferation of bronchiolar epithelium, uh, it's the, just the benign counterpart to the bronchoalveolar carcinoma, but they do occur fairly frequently, and uh, they can be recognized histologically. Sometimes they'll be uh, diagnosed radiographically and, and, and will be removed to, uh, so that you should be, a, in a, particularly in a surgical service, you should be aware that a distinction needs to be made between benign and malignant uh, tumors of the lung. This is a very, uh, very interesting tumor. This is a cat lung, and uh, these are uh, tumors that are usually pretty uh, uh, not very impressive looking when you look at the, at the lung tissue. Uh, in this particular case, we have two, uh, uh, we have a bilateral lesion, both of which are, are small consolidated areas that could easily be mistaken for a scar tissue. Uh, uh, these, these tumors are interesting because uh, the metastatic disease is really what uh, is uh, of clinical significance in, the, in these animals. Uh, and, they ha and they have a couple of different patterns that I uh, think people should be aware of. One is, the one that's really in the literature, uh, was, was reported, I believe, by Danny Scott, uh, uh, and that is a uh, uh, vascular restriction to the distal extremities. Uh, and these are uh, animals with uh, painful and scruffy toes. And if you do a biopsy, what you find is respiratory epithelium invading blood vessels in the, in the distal extremities. Well, you should think then of lung, lung tumors. Uh, I'm aware of this disease because it also affects the eyes. And what you see uh, fundoscopically are multifocal areas of uh, retinal uh, uh, infarction.
and uh, you should think of respiratory tumors. Uh, you'll also, you can also see infections in other systems as well. Uh, first case I became aware of this had a, uh, presented as a neurological case and there was infection in the brain. So let me, having said that, uh, I, I think you have, might have a hard time believing it looking at the relatively quiescent appearance of the, of the lungs here. This is the postmortem inflated radiograph of that lung and you can see a bilateral, uh, fairly symmetrical, small tumors. These are usually very small tumors in there when they originate. This is one of those areas histologically. Hist histologically, on first examination, they're kind of disappointing as well. You really don't have an expansile mass here. You have a nice uh, bronchus and bronchus, uh, some interstitial pneumonia. Uh, and on first examination, you might think that's a bronchus too. But uh, when you look at that on higher magnification, this is the internal elastica, and this is the tunica muscularis, I mean the tunica media, and uh, this is well-differentiated uh, respiratory epithelium, ciliated respiratory epithelium. You might find goblet cells in there as well, but this, this is lining a blood vessel, pulmonary artery. And that's the hallmark of this. These are vasoinvasive, well-differentiated respiratory carcinomas. This is the brain from the case I, I mentioned as the first case I, I saw with an infarct. If you look at the blood vessels around this infarct, they're lined by well-differentiated respiratory epithelium, some of them secreting mucin. Oops. This is the typical appearance of the eyes uh, from, uh, I have three cases now that have ocular lesions that are exactly like this. Uh, uh, very geometrical areas of uh, hyperpigmentation of the retina, which when you cut across them are areas of retinal infarction or at least profound retinal atrophy. Uh, and then uh, look in the choroidal blood vessels, you find well-differentiated respiratory epithelium. Some of the blood vessels have more anaplastic cells, but if you search around, you can usually find uh, uh, well-oriented, well-differentiated, uh, ciliated, uh, sometimes stratified squamous, sometimes mucus-producing epithelium. I guess that's probably the end of a carousel. Invasive carcin pulmonary carcinoma. Uh, it's been reported in the literature just as pulmonary carcinoma, and you will sometimes see uh, uh, an exaggerated vasoinvasiveness to uh, more garden variety, space occupying masses in the lungs of cats. It could just be that we're looking at a, a morphological variation, variance from anaplastic. Uh, you know, garden variety, space occupying lesions in cats to other ones that, in which the vasoinvasiveness is much more uh, uh, active. Uh, uh, other, Danny Scott and other people that have written about similar lesions uh, uh, with a lot of vaso uh, invasion and, and infarctions uh, haven't stressed the small nature uh, of the tumor. But I've got uh, at least two cases where, except for the tumor in blood vessels, you wouldn't recognize that there was any neoplasm in, in that. The first one, the one I showed you there, and uh, another one. And you have to be real careful to, to catch the lung tissue. I've got another one that invades into the thoracic cavity and st has a lot of stimulation of uh, rib tissue le leading to a big mass that was originally diagnosed as, as osteosarcoma uh, because of the proliferative bone tissue. Uh, but uh, that uh, uh, cat has a vasoinvasive tumor with a good thing to do is to, whether or not there's scruffiness of the toes, is to cut the blood vessels of the distal extremity and you'll find the uh, tumor there. Uh, at least in my limited experience with the, with the mass. Okay, I can't resist showing you a few eyes. Uh, one of my uh, loves of pathology is uh, ocular pathology. Uh, not something you usually expect to find in a discussion purely of gross, uh, uh, gross pathology, but uh, I hope I can leave you with, uh, if nothing else, the impression that, that it, it is a good idea to uh, uh, do a thorough gross examination when you're dealing with, uh, uh, with ocular pathology. And uh, I will fairly routinely uh, do a thorough uh, dissecting microscope examination of, of uh, at least globes that are well preserved and not filled totally with the ex either exudate or neoplasia uh, to, uh, to examine the various intricacies and interstices of the, uh, uh, of the globe. Uh, this is just an example of persistent pupillary membranes associated with anterior, I mean posterior synechia in, uh, in uh, a, a young animal, this could be either a dog or a cat. Uh, uh, persistent pupillary membranes are usually uh, one of several uh, uh, congenital abnormalities that you find in an animal. This particular one ha also has microphakia, almost certainly would have an anterior subcapsular uh, cataract uh, at, the, at the point of uh, the posterior synechia, synechia here. Persistent pupillary membranes are uh, hereditary in uh, Basinji dogs. Uh, 
and uh, most commonly they're, uh, they're either an incidental finding of limited clinical significance or they are a clinical hallmark that there are further and more uh, uh, ocular congenital ab abnormalities and further workup should be, should be made. Uh, just one more word about persistent pupillary membranes. Uh, in, in terms of the general category of disease, uh, they are uh, uh, one of several manifestations of inappropriate development of the anterior chamber, anterior, uh, anterior segment dysgenesis. Uh, and we do see much more severe cases of anterior segment dysgenesis, and some of those are breed-related or hereditary, particularly in the, in the Doberman Pinscher. We will uh, recognize uh, uh, more severe forms of anterior segment dysgenesis, uh, uh, many, many times leading to congenital glaucoma. This is another disease we see in, in Doberman pinchers, and this is persistent hyperplastic primary vitreous. Uh, the, uh, the definitive, the, the secondary vitreous, uh, is uh, made by uh, secretion of collagen fibers, mainly from Mueller cells of the retina, and then filling of that space by hyaluronic acid, which is secreted in the ciliary body epithelium. And then, of course, the bulk of the vitreous is, is fluid, which is uh, imbibed from the aqueous. Uh, the primary vitreous, though, the precursor to the to the secondary vitreous uh, is a fibrovascular tissue, uh, the blood vessels of which and the, and the fibers of which uh, come from the original mesenchyme that it involutes into the, uh, into the vitreous space prior to the time that the, that the uh, globe is fully formed. Uh, under normal circumstances, those blood vessels and fibrous tissues will undergo complete atrophy. In a hereditary condition in Doberman pinches, we will have persistence and hyperplasia of that tissue. In actual fact, when you look at this histologically, you commonly find pigmented tissue. You can also find uh, little crests of uh, uh, ectopic neural tissue in these things. So I really think that, the, that uh, an, a primary vitreous dysplasia is probably more appropriate than, than the term uh, persistent hyperplastic uh, primary vitreous. Another vascular structure that's associated with and, and incorporated in this disease is persistence of the tunica vascularis lentis, which is uh, the uh, vascular, an, another portion of the vascular structures of the internal lining of the, of the fetal and neonatal eye, in this case originating from blood vessels in the anterior uveal tract. And this structure will also be uh, 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 part of the, persistence of this structure will also be part of the disease in Doberman pinchers. This is something we see uh, uh, in ocular pathology uh, fairly commonly these days. Does anybody know what we're looking at here? This is a prosthesis, yeah. Good thing if they uh, tell you when you're dealing with a globe that has one of these in, because they're hard to cut through with a razor blade. <laughs> so, sometimes they'll drop out and bounce across the floor before you can get them, uh, get them all out. Uh, these are uh, silicon balls, much like a super ball that uh, Ophthalmologists uh, are convinced that uh, you get better uh, cosmesis uh, if you take an unsalvageable globe, uh, uh, open the globe up and remove all the ocular contents and then implant one of these uh, balls uh, which will allow the globe to maintain a globe-like uh, 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 geometrical shape. However, the cornea becomes just as cloudy as, as anything. I'm, I've, I've never been convinced that they're cosmetically any better than, a, than an empty uh, than an empty socket, although I have a, a bias in, in that I want to be able to look at the, at, at the globe. If the, optimum, if the surgeon is doing the job right, they will submit the material uh, that they've taken out of the globe uh, just on the off chance that there is a malignant neoplasm or a potentially uh, recurrent inflammatory disease associated with the, with the primary disease, whatever it is. Most commonly, this will be uh, uh, unsalvageable glaucoma, a painful blind eye. This is just another one. Uh, they're pretty, they're kind of pretty because they give you a nice smooth uh, appearance. The, the uh, dark areas are, are areas where uh, some vitreous material was, uh, I mean some uh, colloidal material was left in the globe. So you still have a few uh, pigmented areas in there. Here's one where uh, the material was submitted and in fact the malignant neoplasm was diagnosed. This is a cat that had uh, malignant melanoma and had a uh, prosthesis implanted in the globe and uh, just as you might predict, uh, this glow, the, the, the tumor uh, grew, uh, continued to grow around the imp implant and uh, eventually this uh, uh, globe had to be removed. It's important to evaluate the uh, vitreous. Uh, uh, we do see animals that have a, uh, uh, diseases of the vitreous, uh, particularly uh, vitreoretinal, uh, the, the coexistence of vitreous and retinal disease is something we see fa fairly commonly.
Uh, we have a number of uh, Labrador breeders around uh, where I live, and we fairly frequently see dogs uh, that have uh, a form of oculoskeletal disease. These are dwarf animals, and the, and the more dwarfed they are, the more likely they are to have severe ocular disease. Uh, this is one of the uh, le least severe animals uh, uh, in uh, uh, animals that just have a subtle dwarfing. Uh, if you do a uh, ophthalmoscopic examination, you can find vitreous strands uh, in an otherwise functionally perfectly normal eye. If you fix the, I prefer Boone solution as a fixative for the globe, but if you fix them in Boone solution, you get a nice uh, opacification of those vitreous strands, uh, and you can fairly easily uh, detect the vitreous abnormalities in these vitreoretinopathies. Animals with severe dwarfing will also have severe ocular disease, and in this, in this case, you'll have uh, severe uh, uh, vitreous uh, 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 collagenization with uh, traction on the retina, and you, uh, you get separation of the retina uh, from the aura serrata and uh, uh, a scrolling of the uh, outer of the separated retina inward. So you have complete detachment of the retina and an inward traction on the retina, leading to a, a uh, an inward collapse of the of the involved retina. And this is the full-fledged uh, vitreoretinal uh, dysplasia, vitreoretinopathy, uh, if you will, that you see in the oculoskeletal system. Labrador retrievers are also prone to uh, retinal dysplasia, which are localized, clinically, uh, clinically silent uh, areas of retinal folding. Uh, and uh, uh, th this disease, that particular disease is not known to be associated with skeletal disease. However, a similar situation exists in the Samoyed breed, which I, I seldom get to see. Uh, you have both of, uh, oculoskeletal syndrome and retinal dysplasia, uh, and they were always thought to be two separate diseases, but it's, fairly, it's recently been worked out in the Samoyed breed, uh, and it appears as if the uh, oculoskeletal system is the homozygous variant of the heterozygous disease, which is associated with, with uh, simply retinal dysplasia. So it could well be that genetically the two diseases are, are related. This is the push uh, for uh, dissecting microscopic examination. There are a few uh, diseases, including blastomyces uh, uh, and uh, other, other uh, granulomatous conditions of the globe uh, where uh, finding the lesion is the trick uh, and, and uh, uh, appropriate selection of the tissue is, is the trick. So dissecting microscopic examination will lead you to discover little granulomatous uh, uh, lesions. Uh, this could easily be uh, blastomyces, but in this particular case, let's see if I have a picture. Nope. In this particular case, uh, uh, ocular larval migraines with um, uh, larval uh, uh, forms of toxicaricanus is the uh, correct uh, diagnosis. Uh, we have a verminous granuloma. Uh, about 30% of the time, you'll find the worm in the, in the granuloma in this disease. It's interesting in that it's uh, almost always a disease of uh, young working dogs, and I think it's a question of heavy exposure. They find uh, uh, animals that are kept together and uh, particularly animals uh, that are kept on concrete, and coprophagia probably has a lot to do with it. Uh, parasite load uh, probably has a lot to do with the development of oc ocular larval migraines, usually in puppies. In dogs, uh, the most common intraocular neopla neoplasm is uh, melanoma, and I said, as I said before, about 80% of these tumors are benign. They're heavily uh, melanized, uh, poorly delineated, uh, but they consist histologically of uh, uh, sheets of very heavily um, uh, pigmented uh, pl uh, plump cells, and in some cases with a background of uh, pi pigmented spindle cells. A small percentage of them are malignant, and they can be identified fairly easily by just using standard criteria for anaplasia, uh, mitotic figures, uh, uh, and a nucleus to cytoplasm ratio. If you use mitotic figures alone, you can easily distinguish between what, we, what I prefer to call benign intraocular melanoma and uh, mal uh, malignant intraocular melanoma. Some people use the term melanocytoma, which is borrowed from a tumor with a different predilection in terms of sight uh, uh, in, in, in human eyes, uh, also a benign tumor uh, uh, that has some morphological uh, appearance to the benign intraocular melanoma. In cats, on the other hand, uh, almost all intraocular tumors are tumors of the uh, anterior uh, uveal tract, and they begin as uh, diffuse hyperpigmentations of the of the iris, and this tumor uh, goes by the name of diffuse iris melanoma in cats. I think, as far as uh, anybody's concerned, they should all be considered to be malignant. If benign um, melanocytic tumors occur in the globe of in the eyes of cats, uh, I'm not uh, uh, I'm not aware of it. I'm sure they do somewhere, some somehow.
The question, we've defined the malignant disease in, in, in this condition in cats. Uh, what we haven't de uh, defined is the, uh, the distinction between uh, change in pigmentation and, and uh, development uh, 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 of, of our confidence in it being a malignant disease. And what I'm trying to say is, uh, in, as cats age, it's not un uncommon for them to develop little pigmented foci in the anterior iris. They're usually known as iris freckles. And uh, uh, since we know this is a malignant disease, early diagnosis, is imp early diagnosis and enucleation appears to be important in, in uh, uh, preventing metastasis. So veterinary ophthalmologists want to know the earliest point in which they can be sure that uh, they're, they're removing an eye for a potentially malignant disease. And that we don't know. All I can say is uh, in almost every case that I've, where I've had a nucleation, uh, the, the uh, increase in pigmentation uh, uh, appears to be associated with a spectrum of diseases that leads to malignancy. A few of these have been followed now, some of them for years, that have begun with iris freckles. And you watch a gradual increase in pigmentation of the globe uh, uh, until you develop uh, iris melanoma. So I'm not sure that there really is a benign disease uh, associated with iris freckle. On the other hand, the iris freckle is, is such a common phenomenon, I'm in no way prepared to recommend a nucleation of the globe as soon as you recognize a localized area of hyperpigmentation in the anterior iris. In the limited work that's been done with these, uh, it appears that, uh, that, in, uh, that there is a leeway period in the uh, animals uh, which have accumulation of pigmented cells only on the anterior surface of the iris that haven't invaded into the sclera are at uh, less risk of developing metastasis than, than animals that have invasion of the sclera. And my recommendation is uh, if you have one of uh, three things, uh, irregular pupil, as you can see here, uh, thickening of the iris in addition to hyperpigmentation of the iris, so you have nodular thickening of the anterior surface of the iris, or glaucoma, that any of those three conditions uh, in addition to change in pigmentation or, or bilaterally asymmetrical uh, pigmentation, uh, the globe should be removed. This is the dissecting microscope appearance of one of these tumors. You can see accumulations of tumor cells in the anterior surface of the iris. Glaucoma is a risk because these uh, tumor cells do tend to uh, exist on the anterior iris, and they, and they have little, very little cohesion to the, to the iris tissue. So they'll drop off and seed the filtration apparatus. So you have filling of the, uh, circumferential filling of the, fil of the irritable corneal angle, leading to a, uh, an angle closure glaucoma uh, fairly early in the, in the progression of this uh, uh, interesting disease. Here's one of these early ones, uh, multiple uh, iris freckles. I don't think we have too much trouble with this one because they're slightly raised, uh, uh, but uh, uh, fairly early. This is what we're aiming for. Notice the, the filtration angle, the pectinate ligaments are still very visible and the, and the structure of the filtration angle is still very uh, uh, open. So this is what we're aiming for in terms of uh, enucleation in, in these animals. Uh, at last year's meeting, Keith Prossi described a, a technique for uh, acquiring material for cy cytological evaluation by uh, put, inserting a needle into the anterior chamber and vacuuming the surface of these hyperpigmented lesions. Uh, he felt that he could distinguish uh, dysplastic or abnormal melanocytic cells from, from uh, uh, normal ones, and that, that might be an interesting way to, uh, to uh, push back the time in which we could make a distinction between the benign and malignant disease. Another interesting tumor that we'll see in uh, both dog and cat eyes, about equal uh, 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 incidence is, are tumors of the epithelial cells of the ciliary body. These are very rare tumors in people, but they occur, they're, they're the second most common tumor, intraocular primary tumor in both dogs and, and cats. They can be either, uh, they can originate either from the pigmented or non-pigmented uh, tissue. Usually they're fleshy white masses, but Occasionally, we'll see them as uh, darkly pigmented masses. Of course, clinically uh, and on gross examination, they, they uh, need to be distinguished from uh, melanoma. Uh, these can, be, can run the gamut from the most benign tumors that uh, infiltrate into the posterior chamber, uh, leaving the ocular tissues alone to a highly infiltrative tumors. I'm not aware of any reports of any of these that have metastasized to distant sites, but they can certainly uh, be associated with uh, destruction of the ocular tissues. This is a tumor that I've become very interested in. It's a tumor of cats, and uh, I'm call, I call it the post-traumatic sarcoma, although people have suggested that uh, uh, feline uh, ocular sarcoma is a better uh, name for it, since the one-to-one -one, uh, interrelationship with the uh, ocular trauma is not very well worked out. 
Uh, these are mesenchymal tumors. Uh, they have a propensity to, uh, when they occur, to sort of fill and line the globe. And the most important th uh, thing is that they usually occur in eyes that have been damaged for a long period of time. Very often you can elicit a history of previous trauma, but uh, 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 as you know, uh, with record keeping and whatnot, oftentimes you'll, you'll, you'll elicit a history of somebody thought there was trauma or they got the animal as a, as a stray and the eye was abnormal when they got it. They assumed it had been trauma. Uh, uh, I first became aware of this disease. I had two cases with a similar history and then I got a third one. Uh, I really hadn't put the trauma story together and the uh, technicians came dashing into my office. There was no history of trauma in this third one. The technicians came dashing into my office accusing me of trying to ruin, sabotage their equipment because uh, the, the uh, blade that they recently sharpened had to become hung up on a metallic foreign body in the, in the globe. So, so uh, obviously there'd been trauma in, in that uh, globe as well. Uh, it, it, it looks as if possibly uh, chronic inflammatory disease may predispose to this uh, disease as well, although again, making the distinction of inflammation secondary to penetrating trauma uh, occurring a long time ago uh, uh, and, uh, and trauma uh, is a, is very uh, problematic. Uh, the, the tumors are quite characteristic in that they tend to line the globe. It's, quite, it's also quite characteristic that the lens capsule is ruptured in, in, in these cats. And I have a personal theory, which I'm working on, that uh, the uh, 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 cell of origin, at least in at least some of these uh, cats, are released lens epithelial cells following, uh, following trauma. These are malignant tumors and they can cause, ultimately cause the demise of the animal in a number of different ways. Uh, uh, reoccurrence in the, in the uh, orbit is a common phenomenon. Distant metastasis is a less common phenomenon, but when it occurs can be quite dramatic. And uh, we also see a fair number of tumors. Uh, this obviously we diagnosed this one at necropsy. Uh, this was not a biopsy submission, but uh, 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 invasion of the optic nerve occurs fairly early with uh, uh, with involvement, uh, uh, in the, what happens to the animal eventually becomes blind when you have involvement of the optic chiasm, but they can also develop neurological signs when, uh, when the brain is in, in invaded in some of these uh, cats. Okay, this is a phenomenon which, uh, if you haven't heard of, will probably be uh, uh, s s of considerable importance in the future. And this is uh, also a disease of cats, and uh, it, it looks as if, uh, uh, the development of spindle cell sarcomas uh, at the site of uh, vaccination is, is uh, a developing phenomenon that we're becoming aware of in, in cats. Uh, not much is known about it other than that. Uh, uh, people have known for a long time that, uh, that vaccination points in cats have the potential of developing an inflammatory proliferative disease uh, uh, which consists of a granulomatous inflammation with a intensely proliferative fibrovascular proliferation and also intensely proliferative lymphoreticular or lymphocytic uh, proliferation. These lesions can look almost like a lymph node when you, when you uh, uh, get them. They can also, those, those proliferative lesions can also be recognized by the presence of uh, uh, granular macrophage cells, which uh, uh, when, if you study the material in the macrophages, it turns out to be uh, aluminum oxide, I believe. Uh, 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 aluminum oxide is, uh, is potentially an adjuvant, adjuvant for uh, some of the vaccines that are used in cats. Uh, there may be other ways in which aluminum oxide can get into these granulomatous re reactions. They may, uh, but if there are, I'm not, uh, I'm not aware of them. Uh, and then uh, Maddie Hendricks uh, at Penn uh, has been the person that's uh, done a lot of work with this uh, disease. Uh, she, uh, after seeing a few of these proliferative lesions that have suggestive tumors, uh, she went ahead and, and looked at the distribution of uh, fibrosarcomas in the uh, in the in the cat, other than in the oral cavity and a few other areas that wouldn't be associated with vaccination, and discovered that uh, recently, far and away, the most common sites are, are sites where vaccination might occur: the abaxial muscles of the spine, uh, the subcutis between the uh, between the uh, what are these bones here? Scapulas, <laughs> and uh, and then the thigh are the areas where uh, 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 fibrosarcomas or spindle cell sarcomas most commonly occur in cats. Uh, we recent, I recently had a case in which the uh, cat was vaccinated by the owner who was a veterinary ophthalmologist at, uh, at the University of Wisconsin and he uh, watched this tumor develop at the, at the site where he had vaccinated the, the cat. So we have a fairly good history in that case that, that the tumor developed at the vaccination point. Also not much is known about what vaccines are, are involved in this. Uh, again, record keeping is, uh, is problematic. Uh, 
It was originally thought that the newer vaccines that have been uh, produced uh, uh, in response to uh, the increased awareness of rabies in the east, uh, uh, rabies in cats in the east because of the, uh, the uh, northward migration of raccoon-related rabies, uh, uh, that's been in the news a lot, and, and, and local uh, municipalities have passed uh, vaccination laws for cats, so there's been a big demand for vaccines and, and to vaccinate cats, whereas they hadn't uh, been so aggressive uh, about vaccination programs uh, prior. Uh, so uh, some of these vaccines are designed for subcutaneous vaccination, and there was initially, and there may still be, that uh, some of those products are, are more, uh, more at risk of de uh, develop, uh, being associated with these tumors. Uh, uh, but I think that needs uh, a lot of work needs to be done on, on this particular disease. Uh, this is an example of a, uh, one of these sarcomas that's developed in the muscle. Some of them develop subcutaneously, some of them develop in the muscle. Uh, most of them are spindle cell tumors. Uh, the one that I had uh, 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 stained for uh, smooth muscle actin and, and had uh, more, uh, ultrastructural characteristics was suggestive of a myofibroblast, as does, by the way, most of the, of the post-traumatic sarcomas in the eye. That's why I became interested in it. Uh, uh, but uh, I think fibrosarcoma is as good a diagnosis as, as any. A few of them have, have been diagnosed as other things, malignant fibrocystocytoma, which also shares many characteristics with the myofibroblast. Uh, I think you could, we could argue all day about the cell, side, cell of origin of malignant fibrocystocytosis. I wouldn't be a part of that argument, but someone else uh, could be, because uh, I, I don't use the diagnosis. Uh, Oh, osteosarcoma has been uh, uh, diagnosed, and I should also add that osteosarcoma is also a possibility for the ocular tumor. So I think there's some interesting similarities between this tumor and the post-traumatic sar uh, sarcoma in the globe. And I think potentially there might be a, an, an interest in, uh, in the regulation of the proliferative response of wound healing in cats or, or the proliferative uh, uh, mesenchymal response of... Uh, of inflammation or chronic inflammation uh, in cats in terms of oncogenesis. Uh, so I think this is going to be a disease which people will uh, become progressively more aware of, not only because of its uh, obvious uh, importance in, uh, in veterinary practice, but also because of its implications in oncogenesis. Okay, we see uh, tumors of the orbit. Uh, a uh, variety of different uh, types of tumors of the, of, of, of the orbit. The uh, ones that I'm interested in are, are tumors that originate from the uh, meninges. Uh, we see meningiomas uh, uh, in dog eyes that occur in one of two ways. We see them, uh, tumors which originate in the brain and grow down the optic nerve, and in those cases you get a, uh, the, the dura mater remains intact and you get a thickening of the optic nerve. Often that's a bilateral tumor so that you'll have blindness. The tumor originates in the brain and grows down both optic nerves, so the, so the animal will often be blind and have a thick optic nerve, but no uh, space occupying mass of the, of the orbit. And then you have a second time, which, originate, which is unilateral and originates in the orbit, and uh, uh, fixation of the globe, uh, exophthalmus, and in some cases, endophthalmus, because the globe becomes fixated and pulled inward, uh, uh, can be the clinical problem in, in these cases. Uh, and these are meningiomas which extend outward from the uh, optic nerve. This is an example of one originating in the brain and extending down the uh, optic nerve. The, the thinning here is an artifact of my removal, but uh, uh, the, you can see thickening of the optic nerve uh, all the way down to the, to the globe in this case, uh, with the tumor originating here at the, at the, near the circle of Willis. I think, uh, just to go back to that other one, uh, if you look histologically at the normal meninges of the, of the distal portion of the optic nerve, you can find menin meningothelial cells, uh, arachnoid villus cells, which extend through the dura uh, and exist in, the, in an epidural space. And that's the only place in the, in the canine central nervous system where these meningothelial cells uh, exist outside the dura. Uh, and it's my theory, anyway, that uh, it's from those little cell rests of, of uh, uh, arachnoid epithelial cells or arachnothelial cells or whatever you want to call them that uh, these tumors originate. They're, they're very plump epithelial-like tumors and, and I've, uh, the, I've had a few cases where they've been misdiagnosed as squamous cell carcinoma. In fact, uh, uh, a very famous uh, uh, diagnostic veterinary pathologist uh, whose name I will keep secret uh, uh, had, a case, uh, had a case that we were looking at that had originally had a tumor in the globe uh, and then uh, some years later developed a tumor in the oral cavity. And of course, on the submission form, that no, he was not informed that uh, there had previously been a tumor in the, in the orbit. Uh, 
uh, and uh, he made the diagnosis of squamous cell carcinoma of the uh, oral cavity, which I think is understandable, but when you actually looked at the tumor, the, the, it was morphologically, it was a uh, meningeal tumor. Meningiomas uh, are uh, fairly common in both dogs and cats. In my experience, when they occur ventrally, they, they're uh, much more adherent to the brain tissue, and uh, of course, there, you also have association and destruction of numerous uh, uh, cranial nerves. Uh, they tend to occur ventrally more commonly in dogs. They tend to occur dorsally more commonly in cats, and in that case, they tend to fall off from the brain, and uh, what you're left with is uh, uh, the, a divot of uh, neural tissue where the, uh, where the tumor had previously been. Sometimes you'll find that these cats have a history of neurological disease like seizures or something fairly nebulous, but oftentimes, I really can't remember this specific case, but oftentimes incredible tumors uh, are incidental findings in, uh, in aged cats. When Dr. McGrath uh, taught me neuropathology, I must have gotten this slide from Dr. McGrath. I was just a little boy in 1961, but uh, uh, he uh, always stressed the importance of looking for symmetry, and I've never forgotten that. When you cut a section down, the first thing you want to do is look for the, d define the midline of the brain and, and look for symmetry, and, uh, and then uh, the lesions start, to, once you've uh, established the symmetry, then the lesions uh, uh, come uh, uh, up, up apparent fairly readily. And obviously there's a space occupying mass with an asymmetrical enlargement of this side of the globe here. Uh, if you study the symmetry of the, of the white matter and gray matter, you can recognize that there's a destructive le uh, space occupying lesion, uh, both inflammatory disease of the neuropil and uh, neoplastic disease of the neuropil uh, uh, has, uh, is often characterized by very poorly delineated boundaries. And a, a study of symmetry is uh, an important aspect of the disease. This could be neoplastic or it could be uh, uh, granulomatous meningoencephalitis. This is a dog brain. Uh, there could other be, be also other inflammatory disease, but that's, that's the disease we diagnose most commonly. This particular case uh, uh, was a uh, tumor of glial cells, a, a glioma, if you will. Uh, and again, uh, people can argue uh, all they want or, as to whether a particular glioma is, an uh, is of oligodendroglial origin or astrocytic origin. Uh, sometimes they're obvious, but mo uh, very often they're, they're nebulous. And I, and I will excuse people if they just use the term glioma. Uh, for those of us that have been around for a while, uh, what we now call granulomatous meningoencephalitis, uh, we used to call uh, uh, reticulosis. Uh, and there may be one of the problems in veterinary pathologists is every lab gets their own set of criteria for these things. There may be labs around that still make the distinction on, based on Lord knows what morphological criteria. They may be, uh, they may be correct for all I know. I'm not trying to say that, say that, uh, that uh, trying to make these distinctions is wrong. Uh, it's just that uh, whereas we used to call them a, a proliferative uh, lesion of unknown etiology, for presumably of a reticuloendothelial cell. Now we consider them granulomatous inflammatory disease. We still don't know what causes it. And uh, 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 just uh, playing around with the semantics. Sometimes they're a little bit more obvious. Again, let's look at the symmetry here. And this one, uh, I don't think anybody would miss the presence of this uh, solid lesion. Again, this is a, a glial tumor in a dog brain. Uh, another tumor that uh, I, I find quite interesting that occurs in uh, uh, dog brains mainly are tumors of the uh, choroidal, uh, choroid, uh, choroid plexus, choroid plexus papillomas or choroid plexus tumors. Uh, the most classical uh, occurrence for these is where the choroid plexus sticks out through the uh, at the in the area of the fourth ventricle, and the, and so you look at it so sort of here in the armpit of the of the uh, uh, cerebellum. Uh, a space occupying mass associated with closure of the fourth ventricle and an acquired then uh, hydrocephalus uh, uh, sort of upstream from, from where the tumor is. There's also, don't forget though, that there's choroid plexus in the lateral ventricles as well, lateral and third ventricles. And here's, we have one in the third ventricle. Again, space, uh, hydroce relative hydrocephalus uh, upstream from the mass because of uh, closure of the uh, opening of the aqueduct of Sylvius. What's interesting to me about these tumors is that they uh, have an, uh, an interesting metastatic uh, pattern of metastatic spread, and that is that they uh, little clusters of tumor cells will drop off and distribute themselves through, uh, throughout the, wherever uh, the cerebrospinal fluid goes. So it's not uncommon histologically to find little seeded foci of tumor in, from these guys, from these tumors uh, uh, anywhere uh, in the subarachnoid space uh, 
overlying the uh, cerebral cortices or the uh, cerebellum. Uh, and here we have tumor masses, uh, even compressive tumor masses, uh, opaque tumor masses at the, at the medulla oblongata around the foramen magnum. And I've seen dogs whose primary clinical disease has been spinal cord disease, even distal spinal cord disease due to compression of the spinal cord from uh, subarachnoid space or cerebral spinal fluid metastasis from a, from a choroid plexus papilloma. If you don't see one here, you've got to remember that you have to cut the brain and, and sometimes you'll find a tiny little tumor in the, in the third ventricle uh, leading to disease on, on a, associated with this metastases. Oh, this is just an, uh, me playing around with frozen heads again. Uh, this is a, a cat head I put in the freezer before I uh, opened it and uh, it's got hydrocephalus. The brain is still in there. Pretty normal, someone said. <laughs> Intervertebral disc disease has always been a challenge to me uh, in terms of uh, necropsy diagnosis, uh, and it uh, became a little bit more understandable when I started uh, looking at some normal. This again, I froze this and uh, sectioned it, and you can see the nice uh, configuration of the normal intervertebral disc, the nucleus pulposa on the dorsal uh, fibrous annulus. Uh, in a position in which they normally should be. Notice the straight uh, uh, line uh, and, the, and the continuity between the uh, inner aspect of the fi uh, dorsal fibrous annulus uh, with the periosteum of the vertebral body. Also the close association with the ver uh, vertebral uh, plexus, the ventral vertebral plexus, the venous plexus. Uh, just a little bit higher magnification of the same thing. When you have a disease like this, I think it's most uh, uh, quite easily recognizable. This is a large amount of uh, degenerative uh, intervertebral disc material which has prolapsed in a sudden explosive event uh, into the spinal canal associated with malaysia, the spinal cord. Those are not c conditions in which uh, any, uh, there, a, a diagnosis is a challenge. Uh, but we get a lot of proliferative lesions like this where we have, uh, this again I froze, uh, uh, we have what appears to be uh, constrictive lesions associated with proliferation of the dorsal fibrous annulus, removal of that nice nucleus pul uh, pulposa, and histologically you'll find nucleus material uh, in all the areas of this degenerative and proliferative cartilage, uh, uh, cartilaginous material. And on gross on a, uh, necropsy examination, when we remove the spinal cord, you can recognize these lesions as, as uh, upwardly proliferative uh, uh, lesions at the at the inner space at the articulation of the vertebral bodies, and there's a second lesion here. These can be recognized histologically, too, because of the lack of the nucleus pulposa and the narrowing of the, of the disc space. Uh, doesn't necessarily always mean that there's clinical uh, spinal cord impingement. In fact, in this case, there was no history uh, uh, of disease. Uh, uh, the radiographic appearance was noted uh, as an incidental finding uh, in when the dog was radiographed for other lesions. Uh, again, a chronic uh, disease, uh, absence of nucleus pulposa, and the, most of the lesion is associated with fibrous uh, proliferation and, uh, and uh, ectopic nucleus material uh, incorporated in that, in that proliferation. Uh, the distinction between uh, uh, clinical disease and uh, insignificant uh, lesion becomes very difficult for me in these, uh, in, uh, in these conditions. Uh, this is just another one, very, even more chronic, with remodeling of bone and osteophyte formation, as well as uh, ventral bridging spondylosis in an in a even more advanced uh, and chronic uh, degenerative disease of the intervertebral disc. Uh, I've seen a few cases like this. I've not seen it reported anywhere. I wonder if other people have, too. I'm convinced that in, in a few cases, uh, nucleus pulposa material will uh, prolapse into the spinal canal and will persist as tissue that, which can potentially grow. And uh, you see this uh, proliferating fibrovascular tissue, some of which becomes ossified. Uh, this was an incidental finding in a dog, again, where it was recognized radiographically, and I sort of went in after it. Uh, but I've, I have a couple of cases like that, and my only explanation for it is uh, that it is uh, prolapsed uh, nucleus pulposa, which survived and grew. <laughs> Uh, well, let's do this one other uh, disease, and then it's time for break, right? Is that why you're standing there? <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is, uh, uh, again, uh, me playing around with frozen tissues again. This is a uh, dog uh, that had um, neurological deficit uh, associated with an absence or a hypoplasia of the uh, 
odontoid process of the second vertebral uh, uh, body uh, uh, and the odontoid process, here's uh, C1 and C2, the odontoid process should be a stabilizing structure which uh, is, uh, extends from the, the ventral aspect of C2 over the ventral aspect, uh, over and inside the ventral aspect of uh, C1 and you can see that there is none here. Uh, there, the compression that occurs is not so much associated with the absence of the odontoid process but the development of instability and, and osteophyte formation uh, due to the osteoarthrosis that occurs in, in these animals because of the instable uh, articulation. This is just a normal, and this is from, an, uh, from other animals, but uh, this is what it's supposed to look like, and this is what it looks like when, you, when you've got that lesion. pathogenesis and cell of origin of these tumors. Uh, the, obviously the, the clinical disease is associated with loss of function of the segment of the spinal cord between the uh, brachial plexus and the uh, pelvic plexus, uh, uh, so uh, involvement of the uh, rear quarters of the, of the dogs with uh, uh, paralysis uh, due to spinal cord uh, compression. Uh, on gross examination, these uh, tumors are sharply delineated uh, masses uh, which uh, sometimes appear to, uh, uh, to bulge outward from the substance of the spinal cord, but often uh, at least a portion of these tumors occur on the surface uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the dura mater of the spinal cord. Uh, if you look at them histologically, they have a very complex histological appearance, including these uh, uh, very blastic primitive uh, uh, cells uh, that have reminded some people of neuroblastic cells, although I don't think... Uh, I really don't think they're uh, of neuroblastic origin and then very well delineated uh, epithelial structures as, uh, as well. Some people have hypothesized that these are uh, uh, in fact nephroblastomas uh, originating from uh, uh, rests of uh, cells destined to become uh, renal tissue that uh, have become trapped in, on, on the midline in this particular area. Uh, and I'm not aware of any other species in which uh, tumors in this, of this type in this area have uh, originated. Uh, One uh, fairly common uh, tumor which causes spinal cord compression that we see in dogs are neurofibrosarcomas. Uh, some people will refer to these as uh, neurofibromas or schwannomas. Uh, once again, as, off, as is often the case, uh, we really don't know much about the, uh, the at least I don't know much about the uh, particular uh, tissue of origin of, uh, of these tumors. Uh, they're tumors that, that are, uh, originally develop in the uh, peripheral nervous system and can lead to central nervous system disease due to uh, invasion and uh, compression. Uh, far and away the most common site for these uh, tumors to occur is in the brachial plexus and they are sometimes referred to as brachial plexus tumors uh, uh, in, in dogs but they can occur. A second most common site is in the pelvic plexus uh, and the, but they can occur anywhere in between. I've seen them in cranial nerves and I've seen them uh, uh, just uh, 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 last week or the week before last uh, we had one of the C1, C2 interspace uh, that was uh, uh, removed uh, and submitted as a, as a biopsy specimen. So they can occur in other sites as well. Uh, fairly typical appearance. Uh, if you do go to the trouble to dissect out the brachial plexus, you'll see the number of different nerves that are involved. And I think that's simply by, uh, because of uh, uh, the continuity, the, the anatomical continuity of these uh, tissues with inner branching nerve uh, segments. Uh, and they extend both uh, distally and they extend proximally through the vertebral foramina leading to compression of the spinal cord. Here's another one. Uh, tumor, uh, 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 you can see now the inner branching, uh, so that's why they call the brachial plexus a plexus because there's a lot of inner, inner branching uh, between the nerves uh, uh, which uh, originate in the axial, I mean which uh, uh, branch in the axial area. Here's one, uh, this will be the sciatic nerve and you can see a neurofibrosarcoma or, or a, a nerve sheath tumor, uh, whatever you want to call this uh, tumor uh, uh, originating in the pelvic plexus, although there's no compression. In this particular case, there's no compression of the, of the spinal cord or, or cauda equina. This was kind of a fun project that I did a while ago. Uh, uh, 
I don't have a, a gross picture of a, of a dog with an oral hematoma, hematoma of the ear, uh, but uh, I, uh, I'm sure if uh, any of you are in, in small animal practice, you'll see a number of dogs that, that come in with uh, bleeding into the, into the ear, usually still liquid hemorrhage that can be aspirated uh, from the ear. I became interested in this because uh, there was uh, so often you read in the surgery books uh, that, the, that the hemorrhage occurs between the cartilage and the, and the skin. And uh, I, uh, there, I knew because there had been an uh, article written in, a, uh, in an old uh, vet path which uh, very uh, convincingly showed that, in fact, the hemorrhage occurs in the fracture in the cartilage, which becomes fractured uh, due to the trauma. So I had an opportunity to look at a few of these, and I took some pictures, uh, even wrote another article, because, uh, because really people seem to be ignoring this one uh, nice article that was in veterinary pathology. Uh, uh, and uh, we, we quoted about 15 different sources uh, in surgery textbooks that uh, said that the hemorrhage occurred between the, uh, the uh, skin and the cartilage on the convex surface of the, of the ear, uh, when in fact, uh, even, even the surgeons would often comment that it seemed to be in the, in the cartilage. But in fact, uh, you, you, if you look at these on cut section, you can recognize that there's cartilage tissue all around where the hematoma is. And uh, if you, uh, well, this is just another one a little bit higher magnification, showing the cartilage itself is split, split apart and uh, fractured. Uh, this is a, uh, I think, an alcine blue stain showing uh, the remnants of the cartilage. You'll have new cartilage proliferation in the healing process and then granulation tissue, if they last long enough to get sort of a cauliflower ear, you'll get granulation tissue filling in the, where the hemorrhage had occurred. And uh, if you look at one that had been operated on, you can see perichondrium here, perichondrium here, this, this uh, dog had had its uh, hematoma aspirated and, uh, and the ear held in place while the healing had occurred. Now you can recognize that there's fractures of, uh, of oral uh, cartilage with granulation tissue filling up the space in between. And of course, that's what you aim for in your, in your treatment. Uh, we even took it to a, uh, uh, a mechanical engineer who, uh, this is an amazing story because in his office, uh, uh, he had these huge tables, and he piled things on the table. There's a, there's a point at which you can no longer pile something on a flat surface because the, the slope uh, <laughs> will, will mean that it falls on the floor. And he had two huge tables in his office that were both piled with things uh, uh, up to the point where anything else that was put on it would, fall on the, would roll over onto the floor. And he reached into, the, into one of those piles, and he pulled out a book and opened the book to the chapter where it talked about the, the physical forces of, of, a wa of wave motion on, on tissues. And, and, and I'm, he, he was quite convinced, and it certainly makes sense that the, you get a whiplash effect when a dog shakes its head. You can even hear almost like a bullwhip uh, sometimes when, when a dog shakes its head, and, and uh, the physical forces of that wave motion uh, leads to a, a, a considerable exaggeration of the forces that occur on the, on the cartilage and the perichondrium, uh, which I'm sure reaches a point in which that cartilage undergoes a shattering. Okay, speaking of the ear, uh, we will, in both dogs and cats, we will see a variety of um, uh, malignant tumors uh, associated with the ear. Probably the most, one that people are most aware of is the squamous cell carcinoma tending to occur in uh, white cats at the, at the ear tip, uh, but we will see squamous cell carcinoma in other uh, uh, areas of the ear, uh, both the lateral ear canal and uh, uh, even in the middle ear. We'll see squamous cell carcinomas originating in the middle ear and then infiltrating uh, either into the orbit uh, uh, occasionally into the nasal cavity or the sinuses or other tissues uh, 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 around. So the middle ear as a site of squamous cell carcinoma, as pri of primary squamous cell carcinoma is something that has to be considered, uh, particularly in cats, but we'll see it in dogs as well. That doesn't happen to be what this is, although it certainly would have to be on a differential diagnosis. Uh, uh, this is a ceruminous gland carcinoma, which much like squamous cell carcinoma, often tends to be a very deeply ulcerative uh, uh, mass. Uh, I just threw this picture in because it's a nice picture of a, of a uh, canine juvenile histiocytoma in a dead dog. You wouldn't uh, <laughs> normally think of it occurring in a dead dog, but this particular one occurred in a dead dog. This is, uh, this is another tumor which uh, uh, is associated with an embarrassment of disagreement among veterinary pathologists, a tumor which I call hemangiopericytoma. Uh, I'm perfectly, I would be perfectly happy to call it the canine spindle cell tumor. <laughs> Some people uh, refer to this tumor as being of neural origin, a neurofibrosarcoma, uh, and 
I don't, uh, I, I, I really, I would prefer calling it a spindle cell tumor uh, and, and, and dropping the suggestion that it derives from uh, uh, blood vascular parasites uh, or, uh, and I certainly resist uh, uh, taking the step of suggesting that it comes from neural tissue. I just don't know what, to, what this tumor uh, derives from. Uh, often we'll get them as solitary uh, 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 submissions, but uh, they're notorious for, uh, particularly when they occur in an area where connective tissue is very tight and you can't do uh, a very aggressive uh, surgical de uh, debridement. Uh, uh, they t they're notorious for local reoccurrence, and, and they, but they usually do not metastasize. They tend to occur in the distal extremities, especially around joints, so this would be a cl fairly classical appearance. They remain epithelial covered, uh, epithelium covered just as long as they can, but uh, when the epithelium becomes stretched and traumatized to, to the max, then you'll get deeply ulcerative lesions in, in these uh, tumors as well. Uh, uh, if you'll promise not to, to spread this, I do ha have a particular pet theory about where these come from. If you, again, uh, if, you, if you make a lollipop out of these uh, tissues and freeze them and then cut them, uh, uh, in the few cases where I've been able to do this from amputation specimens, uh, they do tend to line up along aponeuroses. Uh, my pet theory about these tumors is that they're somehow cell, specialized mesenchymal cells of the, of the aponeurosis, but, but I, I certainly uh, wouldn't add that to the, without any further evidence, wouldn't add that to the, to the, uh, oh, there's another, another characteristic feature of this, of this tumor is its multilobulated appearance, and, and you can uh, see that quite nicely in the, on the frozen section. Okay, now I'm just going to show uh, several pictures of lymphosarcoma. Lymphosarcoma, of course, is one of the most common uh, uh, neoplastic conditions leading to necropsy in both dogs and cats. Uh, uh, we know a fair amount about, uh, you know, the common tissues you see lymphosarcoma in. Here's a huge mesenteric lymph node. It could be a dog, could be a cat, uh, could be just about any other type of animal. Very classical appearance for uh, lymphosarcoma. gigantic uh, meaty spleen uh, on cut section. You can almost see tissues um, bulging outward. Uh, uh, most people would not have much trouble with uh, designation of lymphosarcoma. Uh, cut surface of a lymph node uh, with normal uh, nodal uh, architecture effaced by solid sheets of outwardly bulging. My colleague Jim Cooley likes to call this uh, uh, fish flesh appearance. Cut section of a liver, both a dog and a cat, you'll very frequently find a, a diffuse involvement of the hepatic tissue. Often there'll be a, a particular lobular uh, a predilection, most often with a tumor growing in the, uh, in the uh, portal triad uh, area of the lobule, so you get uh, a prominent lobular pattern in a swollen, pale liver, uh, diffuse lymphosarcoma. I often have trouble making the distinction between fatty change and uh, lymphosarcoma on gross examination. Uh, so diffuse involvement is, is, is the rule. Uh, m uh, multifocal uh, nodular involvement is the, is the exception, but we certainly, my point in this, in this whole exercise is to show you that, the, that there really are no uh, uh, hallmarks for making a definitive diagnosis of lymphosarcoma. This is a dog kidney with multinodular uh, tumor lymphosarcoma. Uh, can't get away from the eyeball here. This is a uh, don't forget that you'll see lymphosarcoma in, in cat and dog eyes, uh, just like you do in chicken eyes. Uh, here's one in which lymphosarcoma is uh, associated with an opaque thickening of the leptomeninges in the cat. Here's a peculiar form I've seen in the urinary bladder a few times. You get uh, uh, follicular cystitis with chronic uh, uh, inflammatory disease of the kidney, but this dog had systemic uh, lymphosarcoma and and these are, this is the neoplastic variant of follicular cystitis. Uh, if you're going for the uh, most bizarre case, oh, I didn't notice there was a foreign signature in there of some kind. <laughs> Uh, if going for the most bizarre case, this is my uh, submission for the most bizarre case. This is a dog in which there was a skeletal, uh, generalized uh, loss of skeletal structure. You can see I chose the jaw here as, a, as my example of, of that. Uh, 
This dog was, uh, came in uh, largely because of hypercalcemia, and you can imagine why, because the skeletal system was being eaten away by neoplasia. Histologically, in the kidney, you had this very peculiar mineralization of the basement membranes of the, of the uh, glomerulus. Usually, I think of tubular basement membranes as being mineralized in hypercalcemia, but in this dog, you look at the von Kassa stain, it almost looks like an immune histochemical stain uh, on this dog's glomerulus. Uh, but uh, that's a, that was kind of an unusual case. Here's one in which the epididymis was specifically involved on, on both sides. Lymphosarcoma. Okay, going back to the spleen, uh, we, get, we get a fair number of submissions of uh, big lumps on the spleen. One of our radiologists once said at rounds that, that in, when dealing with splenic tumors, it's, the rule is the bigger the better. And, uh, I didn't know what he was talking about the first time, but I've uh, come to be a believer in that. These large, solitary, uh, bulging tumors of, of the spleen uh, generally have a fairly good prognosis in terms of, of uh, uh, the uh, uh, failing to discover uh, malignant diseases. Obviously, the tumors we'd be uh, d uh, thinking about would be lymphosarcoma, although I just said that, uh, lymphos uh, that there are no real rules in making a diagnosis of lymphosarcoma, but this would be pretty peculiar. Uh, and of course, hemangiosarcoma, especially in a dog, uh, and uh, and then we get a, another fibrous tumor, which goes by a variety of different names: uh, fibrous sarcoma, or leiomyosarcoma, or fibrous histiocytoma, <laughs> whatever uh, you want to consider it as a solitary, uh, usually tan, tumor uh, that occurs in the spleen of dogs. Uh, so those are the, and then and then benign lesions of. Uh, uh, nodular hyperplasia. Sometimes people call them hemangiomas. Uh, although it's often difficult to actually demonstrate a benign endothelial uh, uh, tumor uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the spleen. That particular one was benign. Hematoma, nodular hyperplasia, I don't know, they're so blood filled that you can't really uh, make a distinction. Of course, you have to, I think most of you are probably aware, in order to rule out malignant disease here, you really have to seriously uh, take, take to heart the fact that you uh, make multiple sections, mainly from the junction between normal and abnormal tissue, uh, looking for small areas of, uh, of malignant disease. Because particularly with hemangiosarcoma, the, the phenomenon of uh, overgrowth, tumor overgrowth and necrosis is, is uh, quite prominent. These are essentially uh, sponges of uh, bloody tissue, so the blood percolates through those sponges uh, very slowly, and hypoxic necrosis uh, occur, can occur uh, uh, fairly readily so that uh, a big tumor, a big malignant tumor may have only small portions of the tumor near the periphery in which there's actual viable t uh, tumor tissue. Sometimes with the metastases you get a, a little red area of metastasis, say for instance in the brain or muscle or something, and you look at that, all you see is blood vessels. Uh, I mean, is, is uh, are, are what remains of the necrotic tissue and the red blood cells with, with no tumor whatsoever, so sort of auto, auto necrosis uh, of, of metastatic, metastatic foci in hemangiosarcoma. So you have to take into consideration that you want, want to look at several sections in order to make a diagnosis of benign tumor. This is one of these other ones, a splenic uh, spindle cell tumor, splenic fibrosarcoma, splenic leiomyosarcoma, uh, whatever you want to call it. Uh, they're characterized by their tan appearance, uh, and, and they most frequently, as opposed to, to uh, hemangiosarcoma, which is most frequently a multinodular disease, this, this disease is most frequently a solitary disease, although not always. Uh, they have a predilection of metastasis to the spleen. Uh, uh, so uh, a, a few weeks down the line, an animal with a splenectomy, uh, such as the one I just showed you, may well come back for necropsy and have a spleen looking like this. Uh, I've, I've heard it often enough that I believe it now. The surgeons will tell you the spleen looked completely normal at the time that they did the, the splenectomy. So I think these metastases occur quite rapidly. Did I say the spleen? I meant the liver. The liver looked uh, completely normal. So let's switch to the urinary system, and uh, we'll start out with uh, some of the common things we see in the uh, kidneys, uh, animals that are dying from uh, renal failure. Uh, the important distinctions are distinguished between chronic and acute renal disease, and uh, this is fairly uh, characteristic of what we see with acute renal disease in dogs uh, and cats. Uh, uh, swollen uh, kidneys, uh, kidneys which on cut section and also on subcapsular uh, uh, examination have a pale, relatively pale cortices. And then the other thing I like to look for is if you can catch the highlights just right, you can see that there's a slight outward bulging of the cortical parenchyma. If you have a really fresh tissue, when you first make your cut here, you'll, you can also appreciate the, the uh, sort of juiciness of the renal tissue. There, there, uh, acute renal disease, the, there will be, uh, I guess it's presence of edema in the 
interstitium. I really don't know why they're juicy, but uh, they're, they're often very moist uh, tissues. The presence of the hemorrhages here are, are neither here nor there in terms of making a diagnosis. Uh, they fit nicely with a, a, a diagnosis of acute renal disease, but you, I guess you don't usually see multifocal hemorrhages in the, in, in the cortices. Uh, so acute tubular necrosis, this particular one happens to be associated with the presence of oxalate crystals in the, in the tubular uh, lumina, so uh, uh, ethylene glycol uh, and toxicosis uh, uh, would be the diagnosis in this case. In cats, the, de the designation or the diagnosis of acute renal disease becomes almost impossible because one of the main features here, of course, is the, is the pallor of the, of the cortex. And in cats, the, the cortex normally, the, the cortical tubular epithelial cells normally contain lipid and they are normally very pale. I'm sure most of you are aware of that. Uh, so that uh, the, uh, a cat can have uh, very prominent and severe shutdown of uh, kidneys uh, due to acute tubular necrosis or acute renal disease, uh, and, uh, and the kidneys can appear normal. And that's my experience anyway. I've uh, had the experience of doing pathology rounds and having just stated that the kidneys look normal, and someone walks in and says the creatinine is 17. And that's just the way it is. There's nothing I, there's nothing I can do about it. That's, and then you look histologically, and of course, and there's massive tubular necrosis. Okay, chronic renal disease, uh, obviously the one thing you want to see then is uh, the presence of fibrosis in the kidney. But there are some different patterns of, of fibrosis depending upon the underlying nature of the disease. This would probably be a kidney from a dog that has functional kidneys. Of chronic renal disease, uh, in order for the animal to, be, to lose uh, renal function, a very large uh, uh, amount of the, of the bulk of the renal tissue has to be involved. Uh, when you see linear interbranching indentations with fibrosis like this, I usually think in terms of uh, a chronic long-standing festering pyelonephritis or perhaps a healed pyelonephritis uh, with segmental areas of the kidney uh, leaving you this kind of river, river furrow or valley-like uh, indentations in the, in the uh, subcapsular surface of the kidney. If you uh, compare that then to what you see in acute pyelonephritis, you can sort of begin to understand why. Uh, in this case, the, the uh, affected areas of the kidney are these bulged pale areas. And you can see there is still a very segmental involvement of acute ascending pyelonephritis associated with urinary obstruction uh, and ascending infection uh, up to the pelvis of the, of the kidney. We saw one of these in a primate, uh, uh, I think it was a primate, uh, looked look, look very, very similar uh, to this. Is that a primate or? I think so. I don't know. Okay, um, very commonly with renal disease, we'll, we'll find uh, small fibrotic kidneys, though, that do not have coarse irregularities in the, in the surface. Uh, and uh, then we're stuck with a uh, dilemma of what we have here, diffuse interstitial fibrosis uh, and what, the, what its cause is, or whether it's uh, primarily inflammatory or degenerative condition uh, or associated with uh, interruption of the blood supply. I really don't have a good answer uh, f uh, for that condition. Certainly we'll see some of these animals that have a profound, lymph mainly lymphocytic inflammatory cell infiltrate in their interstitium associated with atrophy of, of the nephron and replacement of interstitial tissue with uh, fibrosis. Uh, uh, usually you have to, have, to have to somehow deal with the fact that uh, all areas of the nephron are going to be secondarily involved, so there will be some glomerular abnormalities. And making the distinction between chronic interstitial fibrosis or interstitial nephritis uh, and primary glomerular disease uh, can, be, uh, can be difficult as well. Uh, but uh, uh, you will see uh, animals with uh, interstitial fibrosis that, that have, first of all, kidneys that are smaller than normal, paler than normal, and firmer than normal. And then on a subcapsular uh, surface, they will have a very fine uh, irregularity, as opposed to the coarse irregularity that you had in the previous one. Again, uh, I, couldn't, I wouldn't make the dis uh, designation as to whether or not there was or wasn't glomerular involvement in this case, but uh, uh, a very firm, pale uh, kidney, uh, relatively uh, narrow uh, cortex, and an overall small kidney. If the kidney wasn't small and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, wasn't firm and irregular, uh, uh, but uh, you know, still was slightly firmer than normal, had a very uh, uh, almost indistinguishable uh, irregularity and granularity on its cut surface, then I would be willing to, to suggest glomerular disease as a, as a more primary uh, 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 suggestion. But, on gross examination, uh, uh, and particularly without a hi historical workup, it's, uh, it, it's hard to say exactly what's happening in diffusely involved chronic renal disease. One thing that's frequently overlooked with chronic renal disease in, in both dogs and cats is uh, the effect on the uh, systemic circulation and systemic hypertension is a phenomenon that we see fairly regularly. I'm aware of it probably maybe more than some because uh, 
unlike in people where there's a, or there was a multi-systemic uh, health-threatening effect of systemic hypertension. In dogs and cats, the eyes are, are, are the uh, organ that are primarily affected in a clinically significant manner with, with hypertension. Nonetheless, it's quite important when you're doing an autopsy, you can get a clue by looking at the heart, and, and uh, left ventricular hypertrophy uh, uh, is, is something that you'll see fairly regularly with uh, systemic hypertension. And then, of course, if you section in the eyes, you uh, may well recognize uh, uh, hypertensive, hypertensive vasculopathy in the, in the eyes. Histologically, I like to use the PAS stain, and, and the lesions are quite uh, uh, dramatic. Uh, mainly, I want to look at the choroidal blood vessels with a PAS stain. You can see this PAS positive uh, tunica media thickening, uh, uh, fibrinoid necrosis, if you will. Uh, uh, it's really uh, a, a change that so would be associated with malignant hypertension in, in people uh, 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 that I'm aware of. The ocular tissue is particularly prone to this change uh, in animals. You can see it, this is the penetrating blood vessel uh, forming the choriocapillaris, and you can see the same change occurring in the, in the capillary tissues of the choriocapillaris. To a lesser extent, you'll find uh, similar changes in the <coughs> retinal blood vessels, and both retinal and subretinal hemorrhages uh, can be associated with clinical disease uh, of hypertension in, in animals. But a lot of cases uh, do not have clinical retinal disease. Their vision is fine, uh, and yet they still have uh, uh, morphological evidence of hypertension. Of course, measuring the clinical measurement, one of the reasons we know so little about the, these things is the measurement, the accurate measurement of blood pressure in animals is always problematic. Uh, of course, it's the first thing you do when you walk into uh, 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 a doctor's office or a dentist's office or even at the bank. You, when, you're, <laughs> when you're waiting to, to, to see the banker, you can put your hands in something and get your blood pressure measured. But uh, it's problematic in animals because uh, the, of the stress of handling uh, can artifactually change the blood pressure or the or the, uh, if, you, uh, if, you don't, if you want to avoid the stress of handling, then you chemically restrain the animal, and then, of course, that has an, its effect on the accurate measurement of blood pressure as well. Okay, we see some uh, interesting changes secondary to uremia. Uh, the, my sort of rule of thumb with uremia is wherever you have uh, elastic uh, uh, collagen fibers uh, that you're likely to get... Uh, uh, mineralization of those tissues uh, uh, in the body, and that's particularly true in the dog, uh, to a lesser extent true in the cat. Uh, uh, for some reason, in the heart, the endo endocardium of the right, uh, I'm sorry, the left uh, atrium is particularly prone to mineralization uh, in association with the, with uh, uremia. Uh, even rarer than that, uh, uh, the endothelium of the pulmonary artery, for some reason, uh, can get these uh, uh, localized. Uh, plaques of mineralization which subsequently uh, uh, tend to develop fibrin over the surface of them. So the pulmonary artery is an area to look for secondary lesions. Oh, I'm, I guess I don't have pictures of all of them, but uh, 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 more things that people might be more familiar with is what we call uremic frosting of the, of the uh, parietal pleura uh, between the rib cage, uh, and between the ribs in the rib cage uh, is a good area to look for uh, uh, uremic mineralization. The internal and external elastic of blood vessels, particularly the submucosal blood vessels of the stomach and the, and the subepithelial blood vessels of the tongue, uh, are good areas to look for changes of mineralization. And as, in association with the mineralization of the tunica elastica, you can have uh, uh, disruption of and uh, uh, rupture of those blood vessels. So uh, infarctions of the tongue and, and uh, hemorrhages into the submucosa uh, of the stomach uh, associated with gastric ulceration uh, uh, our changes you'll see with, uh, with uremia. The uh, connective tissue of the intraalveolar septum uh, is another area uh, when, in which you get mineralization with secondary to uremia. And then other areas that, as far as I know, are not associated with elastic, but, uh, but in which you also see mineralization are the, uh, intersti uh, the parietal cells of the stomach ep epithelium, the interstitial uh, substance of the lamina propria of the gastric epithelium, and then the uh, muscular walls of the, of the stomach, the tunica muscularis of the stomach, can also become mineralized with uh, uremia uh, in dogs. In cats, the, the, uh, uh, the elastica of the aorta tends to become mineralized with, with uh, uremia, although not very commonly. And in rare circumstances, you can get mineralization of the peripheral lung tissue in, in cats as well, although you don't see as much uh, secondary mineralization in cats with uremia. Okay, moving down the, uh, the 
urinary tract here, we see a lot, again, going back to neoplasia, we see a lot of tumors of the, of the lower urinary tract, transitional cell carcinoma. Uh, characteristically in females, uh, this diffuse involvement of the urethra is a pretty typical uh, appearance. Uh, uh, and then occasionally we will also see solitary masses of the urinary bladder uh, uh, less frequently in females. Though with females, the involvement of the urethra seems to be most, the most common uh, disease. Uh, in young, uh, dogs, and uh, I used to say in young giant breed female dogs, uh, but that, uh, the, that direct association is no longer seems to be very apparent. We see these uh, inwardly growing uh, fleshy masses uh, that uh, turn out to have uh, uh, fairly well differentiated uh, striated muscle in them. So rhabdomyoma or rhabdomyosarcoma uh, is a tumor that we see often in the trigone area of the bladder, these inwardly growing uh, multilobulated uh, fleshy tumors. Uh, if, if this was a, a young dog, then you might think of rhabdomyosarcoma or rhabdomyoma, whichever you prefer. <coughs> this is um, probably from a dog in the uh, uh, postpartum uh, uh, period, uh, oftentimes a dog in which the, uh, the postpartum uh, Recovery and health of the, of the bitch and health of the puppies is uh, perfectly normal, but a dog which continues to, uh, to spot, uh, uh, a bloody exudate continues to come from, from the vulva. Uh, if you, uh, we often don't get a chance to autopsy these animals, but if, uh, if you do uh, get a chance to look at the uterus from an animal like this, you'll often find that uh, the uh, involution of the uterus has, has progressed only to a, uh, to a limited extent, and when you open the uterus, you can count the number of puppies because each one of the placental sites will be still recognizable here. One, two, three, four, five, maybe six over here uh, puppies. Uh, so sub-involution of the placental sites uh, is a phenomenon we'll see uh, in, uh, uh, in bitches uh, uh, occasionally. If you look at this, these placental placentomes, uh, histologically, you can still recognize multinucleated decidual cells which have, are still colonized uh, deeply into the, into the endometrium. Uh, in these uh, in these dogs, occasionally the uh, these uh, 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 multinucleated cells will uh, colonize so deeply in the endometrium that you can have rupture of the of the uterus. And for reasons that I don't really don't understand, uh, whenever I've seen this phenomenon, it's occurred in animals that have been ill. In other words, these dogs have uh, have uh, uh, either had their uterus removed or been submitted for necropsy primarily because of their involvement of the, of the, uh, uh, of the uterus. Uh, they seem to be sterile. They don't, it doesn't look as if they develop a, uh, a septic uh, peritonitis associated with these ruptures, but something about rupturing uh, in the uterus uh, leads to the development of clinical disease. Uh, and uh, we're talking about loss of appetite and, and depression, uh, things that might suggest that, that it's inflammatory in nature, and yet I haven't re recognized, uh, I don't think you can see any evidence here of a raging peritonitis, uh, inflammatory disease. Uh, associated with that phenomenon. Uh, thickening and uh, irregularity of the epididymis. Uh, uh, epididymitis is something that we see uh, with some degree of regularity in dogs, and it is usually bacterial, and it's usually associated with a ascending, or if you insist, descending uh, inflammation uh, 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 associated with inflammatory disease of the urinary bladder in, in, that, in that area. Uh, we seldom see, other than that case of lymphosarcoma that I showed you, we seldom see neoplasms of the epididymis. Uh, this is that same uh, epididymis, I believe, and cut section showing the inflammatory, proliferative disease, inflammatory disease of the uh, epididymis, epididymitis. Next. Okay, we see tumors of the testicle. This is always a fun exercise in uh, tumor identification. Really, I think you probably have about as much uh, uh, likelihood of identifying these tumors on gross examination as, uh, as uh, histologic examination. When they're obvious, they're obvious. When they're, when they're not, uh, it's anybody's guess. And you may have tumors in which you have three pathologists, the three tumors of the testicle, and you may well have three pathologists and get three answers uh, in, some of the, in some of these tumors. But when they're obvious, they're obvious. Uh, Sharply delineated, uh, bulging, soft tumor with an, uh, an orange-red modeling uh, that doesn't cause any deformity of the surrounding uh, te uh, testicular parenchyma is uh, what? Interstitial cell tumor. Uh, a multilobulated tumor with an, which on cut surface has a homogeneous tan uh, uh, appearance with a very prominent out, uh, outward bulging would be what? Seminoma. Uh, 
And then Sertoli cell tumor, I don't really have a good tissue, a uh, good sample of it other than uh, this fixed specimen, but uh, a tumor in which there is obvious distortion of the normal shape of the, of the testicle. Sometimes they're greatly enlarged, sometimes they can even be shrunken, uh, associated with very firm tissue, which does not tend to bulge when you, when you cut across it, uh, uh, is uh, typical for a uh, Sertoli cell tumor. In this case, there's atrophy of the, of the uh, associated testicle. That can occur sometimes just because of the space occupying nature of the disease, but in this case it's associated with estrogen uh, secretion. Tumors of the prostate gland. Uh, these used to be uh, pretty simple to understand. We call them prostate tumors. I also had this curiosity. There's two cell types in which you find uh, uh, clear eosinophilic cytoplasmic blebs in, uh, in the tumor cells, and those are transitional cells in prostatic carcinoma. Well, it turns out that, in fact, probably most of what we're calling uh, prostatic carcinoma, or at least a large amount of what we're calling prostatic carcinoma, are really transitional cell tumors that uh, originate from the prostatic, uh, intraprostatic urethra that invade into the prostate. So I'm, really, I'm not in a position to say I understand prostatic tumors anymore, how many of them are truly prostatic and how many of them are are uh, uh, of transitional epithelium invading into the, uh, into the prostate. Uh, certainly most of the ones that I, I think most of the ones that I looked at before had those, uh, 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 those uh, glassy eosinophilic inclusions in the cytoplasm that, that I think are characteristic of transitional cells. Uh, so I think it's a tumor that needs uh, some restudying. Tumors of the ovary, uh, the one that uh, is always my favorite is the uh, papillary carcinoma. Uh, these are uh, tumors of the uh, epithelial lining cells, very much analogous to mesothelial cells that uh, line the, uh, uh, the uh, salomic surface of the ovary, and uh, they can produce the papillary tumors uh, which uh, behave very much like, uh, like mesothelial cells, and that is that they, when they uh, cause uh, distant disease, they tend to metastasize transsalomically uh, and embed on the serosal surfaces of other abdominal organs, and here you can see seeding of the uh, surface of the liver in a dog with a papillary uh, ovarian carcinoma. Histologically, this, is, this happens to be on the surface of the ovary. But if you, if you section the liver from the one before, it would look very similar to that. Okay, uh, tumors of the uh, endocrine system. I have to go ahead here one time to see, okay. We will see uh, fairly commonly, in, uh, mainly in dogs, we will see uh, tumors of the, of the pituitary gland. Uh, uh, most commonly, they are either incidental findings of, of no clinical significance or associated uh, with disease uh, uh, related to their endocrine function. In other words, they're uh, producing some kind of a hormone, uh, and the one that's most commonly uh, clinically significant, of course, is ACTH leading to uh, a pituitary-dependent uh, Cushing syndrome. Uh, so uh, under those circumstances, it behooves you to look carefully with multiple sections of the pituitary gland to look for functional, small functional adenomas. We will occasionally, though, see uh, large uh, pituitary tumors, uh, whether they're functional or not, will have uh, effect due to their local infiltration, uh, compression of the optic chiasm leading to blindness uh, is a potential problem, and also uh, direct infiltration into the uh, brain tissue uh, can lead to problems. Some situations, these tumors can be flattened, and they need to be uh, distinguished from meningiomas, so uh, meningeal tumors in the same area uh, can, can be problematic in terms of the differential diagnosis. Thyroid glands, uh, not a whole lot to say about gross uh, uh, abnormalities of thyroid glands. Uh, hypothyroidism is a fairly common clinical problem we see in both dogs and cats, uh, and, uh, and uh, 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 the histological evaluation is really needed to uh, say anything about that. And even in some cases, the, the correlation between the, the histological appearance of the thyroid glands and, and the functional status of the thyroid glands is hard to, hard to work out. We will, on rare circumstances, there are a few that are breed related. This one happened to be in a uh, garden variety mixed breed domestic short hair cat uh, of no particular uh, lineage. Uh, uh, I mean, obviously it had a lineage, but no, it, wasn't a, uh, it wasn't a purebred cat uh, uh, in which we have a, a hereditary enlargement of the, or at least a congenital enlargement of the uh, thyroid glands, uh, probably associated with a, what we call a congenital goiter. Uh, 
the histology of this uh, of these of these thyroid glands would suggest that there was an inability to, to complete the synthetic pathway for for producing the thyroid hormone. The animal was uh, 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 was hypothyroid in terms of its measurement of its uh, 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 fully formed uh, circulating thyroid hormones T3 and T4. Uh, and uh, had all the morphological criteria for uh, cretinism, uh, which in this particular animal uh, included the maintenance of a, of a kitten-like hair coat, uh, a failure to grow, a failure of the development, uh, of the continued development of the growth plates, so it remained, it contained, it, uh, its growth plates remained uh, uh, neonatal in terms of their uh, degree of development. Uh, uh, and then, in addition to that, it had a very unusual facies uh, it had a sort of dished out facies, much uh, in, in some ways similar to what you see in cretinism in, in people. There are some uh, fairly well worked out hereditary forms of uh, congenital goiter. Uh, boxer dogs uh, have a f uh, form of uh, hereditary congenital goiter that's uh, been worked out, and occasionally I've seen reports of uh, 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 congenital goiter in other uh, breeds of dogs and cats as well. Uh, this is a disease, I don't know where this disease was when I was learning pathology. Um, it seemed to occur out of the, out of the blue, uh, and this, but it's a very, very common disease in, in cats. It's a disease that tends to occur more commonly as cats get older, and that is hyperthyroidism. Clinical signs of, these, of hyperthyroidism in cats are pretty much what you'd expect. They undergo a behavioral change, they become very hyper. Uh, they, uh, previously docile cats will become aggressive. Uh, they have a ravenous, uh, insatiable appetite, uh, uh, and yet they lose weight. Uh, uh, they have incessant uh, physical activity, pacing and whatnot, meowing, howling, caterwauling and whatnot. Uh, they have polyuria, polydipsia, and uh, uh, poly... Uh, when you defecate too much, what's that called? <laughs> they defecate too much. <laughs> Uh, and then on gross examination of the thyroid glands, they have large and, and irregular nodular uh, thyroid glands. Uh, I think most people are aware of the histological appearance of these thyroid glands. They have multiple uh, lobular uh, proliferative growths. Uh, and again, we get into uh, obscure terminology. Uh, uh, I prefer to call these uh, functional adenomatosis or, or uh, uh, thyroid adenomatosis. Uh, I used to call it toxic nodular goiter. Uh, some people uh, prefer to, uh, to name them as... Uh, multifocal hyperplasia, functional hyperplasia, uh, you name it. They're, uh, if, they're, if they're neoplasms, they're benign. If they're, if they're uh, hyperplastic nodules, then uh, so be it. Uh, one of the characteristic features uh, that allows you to recognize that, uh, that, this is, uh, that there's hyperthyroidism in these animals is you can usually find little remnants of pre-existing non-hyperplastic or not proliferating thyroid tissue in the, in the pushed off to the side in the, in the biopsy specimens. and. Uh, and those uh, show typical uh, signs of, of uh, thyroid atrophy. So that suggests then that there's a shutdown of the pituitary thyroid axis due to uh, 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 production of thyroglobin out, out of control, uh, and, and it goes along then with, uh, with uh, the hyperthyroid syndrome that we see in these cats. Again, I don't know. Uh, we certainly looked at thyroid gland tissues before this uh, tissue became real prominent when we did autopsies. And, and it just seems to sort of come out of nowhere in terms of uh, uh, become, uh, becoming into prominence as a clinical disease. Uh, again, it's another condition in which it behooves you to look at the heart because with the increased metabolism in these cats, they, uh, they develop tachycardia, and one of the phenomena that you'll find is, is cardiomegaly. This is just the heart from one of these animals, uh, and uh, cardiomegaly is easier to recognize uh, when you have the uh, the carcass there in front of you, then it